It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Stacey Higginbotham's back. So's Lou Maresca. It's the battle of the former show hosts. And sitting in between, Brian McCullough from the Tech Meme Ride Home, who is really a, an honorary Twit show host. We're going to talk about the Spotify car thing and how that represents a whole trend in technology uh, of obsoleting things we love. We'll also talk about the NVIDIA Drive Thor, a chip with 2,000 tops that uses more power than 10 light bulbs. We'll also talk about why TSMC says we can't leave Taiwan and the Copilot Plus PCs. Recall has been recalled. It's all coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 983, recorded June 9th, 2024, Digital Snack Wells. It's time for Twit, This Week in Tech, the show we cover the week's tech news. We got some real newsies here. Gonna be fun. Lumoresca's back. We miss him. From this week in enterprise tech he still works at microsoft though where he's a principal engineering manager for is it office yes for the excel group uh in the office platform group and it's uh, my 20th year holy cow yeah, when I does that huge stock crystal vest? yesterday when is the stock vest that's the question <laughs> my, that's right i wanted to keep going up you work for a three trillion dollar company my friend uh very yes. nice to have you lou miss you and love you and i'm so glad you're here Thanks for Good joining team. us. Also from the Tech Meme Ride Home, Brian McCullough, internet historian. Hello. Look at those hello, baby hello. blues, Brian. I tell you what, <laughs> you look like a one true Scotsman with a Robert Caro poster right behind you there and all of that. <laughs> a look. Well, and and the monolith and uh, Alf. And, Alf uh, and everything. It's all there in some sort of video game. Is that a Pac-Man Jr.? It's it's an original Pac-Man from, what, 1982? Maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I recognized it right away, which I'm ashamed to admit. And let us say hello to our dear friend, Stacy Higginbotham, who left us to go to work as a policy fellow at Consumer Reports. It's former host day on this week in Ta -da. Ta -da. Hi, Stacy. Good to see you. Hello, everyone. I am Did reading High Voltage right now for Stacy's Book Club, June twenty seventh in the in the Discord in the Club Twit Discord. Wait, is it June twenty seventh or June twentieth? We moved it. Did you not get the memo? <laughs> I never have the memo. I thought. Okay. I think there was a conflict, so we moved it to the twenty seventh. Does that work for you? Well, you know, we don't have to do that on we'll the air. We'll figure that out. We'll talk about that another time. But Stacy wrote a very good piece in Consumer Reports about the Spotify bricolage of their car thing. How to kill, I love it, how to kill a smart device, a post-mortem on the car thing. And so I thought, we got to get, we got to get, I missed Stacy on uh, this week in Google. We got to get her on. Uh, there's some good news, I think. I think the car. I think there's a, a a movement to hack the car thing. Not official, and at least Spotify turned around and said, "Okay, we'll give you a refund." At least, goodness, this, I mean, <laughs> that is the very least they could do. They're yeah. not even giving you an actual refund. They're just like, "Hey, we'll we'll refund the payments you've already made to us for for your monthly Spotify subscription." But you fees. have to have a receipt. And you have to request it. It won't. It's not automatic. Yeah. But uh, again, okay. the very least they could. At do. The very least at Lilliputing.com, the Spotify hacking community could keep the gadget useful after Spotify and support. So there is apparently an active hacker community has figured out a flash custom firmware on the car thing. Uh, Spotify apparently released source code for the bootloader, Linux kernel, Bluetooth stack, and software updater, yeah. which is fantastic. Uh, it isn't the most powerful device in the world. So it may be, you're not going to be, maybe you could play Doom on it. <laughs> I don't know. You could play Doom on everything. <laughs> well, and I would love to get some smart people's opinions on this. And yours too, Leo. No. Uh, and <laughs> figure out. <laughs> I count on I, that I, from you, Stacey. Count on it. When, 
when we talk about this, I, I have some questions for people because I'm still on the fence on how companies should handle this in a way that's responsible for everyone. So I don't know if we're talking about it now. I think we'll we are. It. I think we're talking about okay. it. Okay. Yeah. So here's my deal. Like two minds. I'm like, yes, open source it, bring it out to the world. But then for this device, it may, it's fine. But for some devices, I'm like, I don't know if I would want to open source like a baby camera or something that has a microphone in it, because yeah. I feel like then people could sideload, like you could upload source code that could, could rat people out. Right. So like give people remote access to things on the device. And so then I'm like, maybe it's not the best thing. And then the secondary part of that is I know the people who listen to the show are like, hell yeah, let's, let's you know, load this on my device, let's maintain it. But for many, many normal consumers, I don't know if that's really no. a viable option. Yeah. yeah. And it's not like you can do a whole lot of wonderful stuff with it. <clears throat> but this keeps <laughs> happening. Remember the Chumbi? Remember Sonos? Um, I was... <laughs> And you, and you ask a good question in your piece. You say, is it a device or it's a service? Consumers think they buy hardware. But really what they were buying is a service, I think. Yeah? Yeah, because these things cost money to maintain over time. And like, even if a company does it right, so you look at something like Amazon, who was like, oh God, these Halo wearables and brand, the fitness brand that we're launching. I have a Halo work. wearable, which just made it to the Leo garage sale last week. I think somebody took it. They're going to get a rude surprise when they can't do anything yeah, with see, it. Yeah, see, that's that's not right, man. <laughs> uh, but Amazon actually did a good job. They told people, they refunded everybody's money and they said, hey, you can send this device into us for recycling. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's like the, one of the better ones you can, for a, not for a Nato. Oh gosh. It's a German company that made the D-Link vacuum cleaners. They actually killed that. And they actually even put parts on like, made parts available for five years accessible to people who bought that. But that is a cost to yeah. the company. You can understand why a company might be saying, you know, we never made any money on this. Here's something that we advertised for years. I don't, I don't think anything would happen if you plug this in. Uh, God knows we haven't tried in a while. This is a sling box. Remember these? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was like from like, 20 years ago. Five? <laughs> I mean, come on, man. But I mean, well, I don't know when it was from, but I mean, so you're saying, so that's the question. What's the statute of limitations? How many years right. should one of these things run for before? Well, so do we some, want to set a number of years for each individual device? Like some things that make sense, like your car, like how long should, like my, my car is a 2013 Tesla. At some, it's 11 years old now. Oh. When are they going to stop supporting that? Mm. Right. For somebody who has a Zune still and still uses it, <laughs> I can tell you that this happens to devices all the time. Does right? Zune I mean, it's, still it's, work, it's, though, in every respect? Oh, yeah, I love it. I love it. I wish it open sourced, right? I mean, that's the thing that I, I still use it all the time. Um, but I would say that these are the types of things. I think that Spotify, I think they, they did a really good thing for people, obviously, to make it available and give them money back and all that stuff. They did more than most organizations would do from a, from a device perspective. Only I after think. consumer pressure. They did pressure. it because people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right? We, like the whole world was like, hello, no. Right. Uh, Brian, you said that the, if there was a day at the Tech Meme Ride Home when it was all about consumer pressure. <laughs> it was all about backlashes. I mean, a lot of it, that was one of them. Um, it's, it's a lot of Microsoft it is AI recall. Based. Microsoft recall. There's a lot of, there's a lot of companies that right now Adobe um, have been treating their customers Mm, for years and it's kind of biting them in the butt as they especially move to this AI stuff or like um, in the like take the Microsoft case where it's like uh, yes uh, you can search everything you've ever done and then people are like well yes but then uh, five years down the road you're going to sell that to um, an advertiser or something because we don't trust you because you've been throwing ads in the start menu and all that stuff. There's two levels with it. Well, let's talk about recall because this, this the story did change uh, over the last couple of days, Microsoft, when it announced its Copilot Plus PCs, including its new Surface, but from a number of manufacturers, they come out uh, June 18th, said that one of the features that will be turned on by default is recall, which will take screenshots every few seconds of what you're doing 
apply AI to understand the screenshot, do OCR, understand images and regions, and then save all that information into a my, uh, I think it was actually a SQLite database on your hard drive, Microsoft said. But don't worry, because it's encrypted with BitLocker. And, uh, and by the way, there's no cloud access. We don't up upload it to the cloud. There's no access for us or anybody else. And if you get a new machine, you start over. So don't worry. To which a number of people, including Kevin Beaumont in his Medium piece in uh, Double Pulsar said, stealing everything you've ever typed or viewed on your own Windows PC is now possible with two lines of code inside the Copilot Plus recall disaster. Steve Gibson on Tuesday uh, rehashed a lot of this, pointing out that BitLocker is not going to protect anybody because as soon as they log in, it's decrypted. So if you had malware on your machine, you logged into your machine, it's pretty easy to exfiltrate out of that database. And because it's so nicely compact, it should be fairly easy to uh, offload it to some other site. Um, and then on, I saw a number of people who don't trust, like, as you said, Brian, don't trust Microsoft. So Yeah, and, and, and like the, the point that people were making, which take this with a grain of salt and, and uh, obviously with the divide of, of nerds, uh, Lots of people take it with a grain of salt, but um, they were like, if, if Apple uh, announced this, Apple has spent many, many years uh, saying we believe in privacy. This is all your stuff. But but they were saying, I think it was Windows Central that said uh, Microsoft has not does not have that, uh, you know, half a trust. decade of yeah. user trust. Yeah. Uh, now, I sh Lou works for Microsoft, but it is not speak for microsoft on this show that's right um the good uh, before you we, we get to your thoughts on this i should uh, absolutely follow up immediately with the fact that after a considerable amount of pressure and a lot of bad press microsoft said oh yeah and by the way but paul Thurot was at great pains to say this on wednesday i think he might have known microsoft was going to do what they did he said wait it's not out yet just be patient you know, anybody who's used it to date has used a hacked version of it. This is not the release version. Just wait. Well, as it turns out, Microsoft now says it will be opt-in, not opt-out, which I think is a big deal, a very big deal. You have to say, yes, I want it as part of the installation on your Copilot Plus PC. Is it you, a big deal or is that like the bare minimum if you're going to do something? Well, you got to so do that because it was, okay. it was opt-out, right? right? It was on by default. That's clearly not a good idea. For preview builds, but yes, it was <laughs> right. opt in. They, I think they wanted it to be opt out, but anyway, they've made it opt in. They also said, and I think this is a very important change, that you can't actually access it until you're verified with Windows Hello. Uh, not just logging into your computer, but actually as soon as you open recall, it'll say, are you you? And it's also going to have proof of presence required. Um, that's, I think, a big deal. Uh uh, we, I, I haven't yet seen what Kevin Beaumont and others have to say in response to this, but it looks like Microsoft listened to the uproar and, and acted appropriately. Now, now that you've heard that story, go ahead, Lou. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll add a little color. I won't soapbox it here, um, but I'll kind of give it from a perspective of an engineer who's been doing this for 20 years is, you know, any type of feature like this, I think I there's a ton of excitement around this type of stuff, right? Like let's put about all these new features out. Like we have new compute power, we have new technology. Let's throw some new stuff out there that could really take a hit and help consumers and help organizations like, in fact, you know, I was thinking about this from an organization perspective, like how can it really help an organization? Well, you know, there's some technology out there that we're hoping to figure out how the configuration of the policies of the machine are changing over time or somebody put malware on my machine how can i look back and what happened and audit that so these are the types of things they're thinking about but i think the, the specific thing that i like to call out is obviously obviously is a preview feature right right up front i think it kind of worked by design like personally is that you know i actually appreciate all of the the feedback people are giving on it and then and obviously people are poking holes in it and as an engineer like poking holes in it is really what we want to have people do, right? I mean, I guess there is some bad press around the fact, oh, well, this is a security problem or this is a trust problem. And obviously people have trust problems with any type of AI or, or, or edge technology. And I think that is the thing that we that Microsoft was really hoping. I mean, and, you know, having this, this type of good or and or bad press actually helps evolve these things moving forward. And is it going to be a great feature? Could be. 
I think it definitely could be a great feature. Could it be, uh, you know, in the current state that it was in, could it be a privacy nightmare? It could have been. Um, but I think that they, they're actually adjusting. Now, again, you know, I'm not a Microsoft fanboy by any means. I have MacBooks. I have, you know, I use all technology. Will I turn this on? Probably not. But, uh, but that's just because I don't need this feature. You know, I don't need this type of thing on my machines. But I think that it could be something good, right? Um, so so I, I would say that there's, I think by design, this happened. I think that they, they now have their feedback. They now know what people want or don't want. Um, and, and now they're going to adjust. Now, the question is, how will the public respond to that? This is an interesting conundrum uh, uh, that uh, all AI has, a right. problem that Apple has. I was uh, going to bring up Apple because they're they're going to they're claiming or German is claiming that the whatever they're going to announce uh, tomorrow is going to be opt in as well. Like that, that, that's what I was going to say is like is the problem here that these are it's not just hey we have a new feature for our OS this is a base level feature of our OS which could change everything that you do with our OS and so like we're talking about a different level of risk or like j just base level engagement you know. But welcome to the world of AI. And and, right. and the thing that's interesting to me about recall is Microsoft was listening to the 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 its constituency, maybe in business, but in general, that said, hey, it would be really cool if AI knew everything about me and could answer questions about my day, what I have agreed to, what I'd like to do, uh, and didn't pay as much attention perhaps to the paranoid privacy focused contingent apple right. which pays a lot of attention to the privacy and the paranoid uh, contingent has as a result not had an ai strategy it's going to be very difficult we interested to see what apple does tomorrow because it's going to be a challenge uh i you know apple already has uh, a backup program that records everything you do and versions of every document it's document focused not screenshot focused but Nobody ever said that about Time Machine, even though it's doing that all the time. Right. Um, I am going to subscribe. I actually ordered the Limitless Pin. This is from a company called Rewind.ai. Look at what Rewind does. Your AI assistant that has all the context. Rewind is a personal AI powered by everything you've seen, said, or heard. I've been using it for two years on my Mac. You see? You see? So this is very similar. Uh, so I could see how Microsoft would say, well, see, people want this. Uh, maybe they should have paid a little more attention to the security side of it. How do you like Rewind, by the way? Um, it is... Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I use it less than I, I... I should not be paying monthly for it, is what I was saying. <laughs> it's $20 a month, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Every AI thing is $20 a month. I did order the Limitless pin with the thinking being uh, this thing records <laughs> all the audio around me at all times, right? And it's just a little a little clip-on thing. It has some interesting features to protect people from being recorded, especially required and legally in some states to be two-party states that they have to agree to be recorded. So it does voice printing and won't record a voice unless you explicitly say to that person, hey, Stacy, is it okay if I record this conversation? And then the voice print that says Stacy agrees, then it will start recording. I think this is That's cool. So what? I think it is cool. But like, let's say you and I have recorded our conversations on this show. Like, obviously, I've agreed to record this. Right. Um, but then later, we're having a discussion over drinks like as a reporter, I'm super sensitive to something like that because I talk to people publicly and not publicly often. And so well, you probably that's a little get dodgy. This. <laughs> yeah. But I would, this is I the, would never. This is the conundrum. This is exactly what I'm talking about. In every respect, these are, we, we, I mean, you, you also could agree as a reporter, it'd be nice to have everything you've done, every note, every interview you've done available to you for an AI to query would be useful. Well, except it wouldn't be because if oh. people, I mean, people go on and off the record all the time. So well, maybe I would have to manually color it red. Maybe they'll fine. color it red when they say off the record. But then, but it's not off the record if it's on a if it's on a computer server. Oh, you, I'm sure there's a button you can stop it. Um, there, all right, there, this there, thing there, is a bad that, idea. But 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 the well, the no, no, point no. is, I think people like the idea of having this data. Look, I want I want uh, her. I want. Uh, an assistant I, I that knows everything like about me, right? Until they experience it 
or they experience like in theory, it's awesome. You're like offloading all the crap tasks from your life to yes. like right. an AI, right? Yes. Except that's not how the world works. And unfortunately, what people are selling us is like, you know what they're selling us? They're selling us digital snack wells. This idea that you can eat all the crap you want and it's not going to have any effect on you. And then later we find out it's probably not good for you. So like, that's what this is. This is in snack wells. We're not a great cookie, right? AI experience right now is not awesome. So it, you're basically that's that's what's but happening. we want snack wells that are really good and good for you. Nope. But, okay, so, again, Leo, I just said that uh, I shouldn't be paying for it every month because I don't use it enough. And, uh, uh, to Stacy's point, and, like, the, the, it's not there yet and whatever. Like, so, um, you know, I use Superhuman for the email. And so there's, there's AI summarization of my email threads, which is good when I get... Uh, an email that I, from a thread that I haven't looked at in six months and there's 15 emails on it. And I'm like, summarize this. What were we talking about? Great. Do you know what's not great is um, here, we'll write the, the email response for you. If I'm going to respond in two sentences to an email, it's faster to just do that. And, and what I'm saying well, you don't is, have is to like, use it that way then just can't you just use it but, to the summaries. Isn't that enough? Isn't that useful? Uh, I guess, but I don't use it enough. And what I just said with Rewind is I don't have to. What was that thing that I said to Leo two and a half years ago? I don't do that sort of search uh. enough. Maybe if I was a reporter, I would. What I'm saying is, is that um, if if AI is all about getting rid of the rote uh, dumb work and here's your here's your perfect assistant that you always dreamed of uh, on steroids, um, I don't use an assistant for that enough. At, at least at this point, and maybe I'm not doing it right. Okay. But, you know. So we've identified a third problem. <laughs> <laughs> so number one, uh, AI sounds like on the face of it, it might be useful. Number two, in order to do that, there are privacy and security risks. Number three, maybe it ain't all that useful after all. We, we kind of have to can face I add a, that. Can I add a fourth item? Yes. Perfect AI context aware AI is going to require as much data as humanly possible, including your private data. The company's gathering this right now. Sure, it doesn't work perfectly right now, but even if it does, they're not going to be able to make enough money based on the cost <sighs> of actually point. doing this. And they're going to have to sell your data. Even if they could make enough money, the way the stock market rewards companies is for continual growth. And the only way to do that is to sell your data. So, if you're building, because good AI is basically surveillance. What we are doing is selling people some entity that will surveil them yeah. and then under the guise of helping them out. I'm Except, okay if I'm surveilled by myself. Yeah. And if I trusted the company to not eventually need to be beholden to stockholders and sell something better, you know, or sell, I'm sorry, uh, boost their profit margins. Which was the Microsoft but, conundrum, as we were saying. Yeah. Well, it's also, I, ironically, the Spotify car thing conundrum, which is yeah. if it can't make money. So number four, and by the way, let's. It's not let's, that it can't make money. It's that it can't. Without make surveilling you. Growth right, yeah. of money. No, it's that. It can't make even enough. if I build you something amazing because of the way the market rewards continued growth, my amazingness has to generate more money over time or well, revenue how, over time. How does that, th that actually makes sense. And how does that apply though to, to AI edging technology, technology where they don't take your data other places and they use the compute power of your own machine and your own, in mm -hmm. your own home to do that. Like how does that apply to, to the, to the theory that you're actually saying there? See, and that's ideally if you do everything on the edge, a company can't, they can make money selling you the hardware once, there you go. but I don't see like I was actually just at this kitchen smart kitchen summit last earlier this week. And the big thing was like, hey, we're going to build a fridge and it's going to have, you know, image recognition for what's in it. And it's going to be all in device because people hate like the idea of people knowing what you have in your fridge, your all fridge. those Ben and Jerry's. Right. Um, but that person said something. And then the next person who got up was like, we're going to take that data and we're going to use the data from your wearable. And then we're going to nudge you into <laughs> behaving properly. And I'm like. Guys. Up, up, you blew it. And <laughs> you said the, the quiet big, part the out biggest, loud. <laughs> the biggest issue with that, I was like, we are taking like 
technology to solve what is a systemic issue. It's not going to solve it, but we're going to say it solves the systemic issue, which is that we're feeding people junk. But anyway. Snack wells. It's I have digital a lot of snack wells. I think you're right. I'm going to add a, uh, how many are we up now? Four. I'm going to add a fifth problem, which is it's adding fuel to a world that is already on fire. Uh, yeah. that, that this is still horrifically energy dependent. Uh, it wouldn't yeah. be on the edge, I guess, unless we all have these massive PCs that are using you hundreds of watts. You don't need massive watts. PCs. Yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. We talked about this earlier today with Sam Abul Samet, our car guy, on Ask the Tech Guys. He brought up the new NVIDIA 4. <sighs> this is an AI chip for cars. Now, remember, the iPad is uh, 38 trillion operations a second, 38 tops. Uh, these AI uh, Copilot plus AI PCs are... According to Qualcomm, the Snapdragon Elite X can get to 45 tops. These, the Thor is 2,000 trillion operations per second. Uh, this thing is massively overpowered because apparently you need it if you're going to drive a car without a human involved. Uh, and NVIDIA is making They're power these. hungry too. Yeah. And oh, yeah, power hungry, over 100 watts of power as they run. Uh, In your in your car. <laughs> so I feel like this really feels like move fast and break things all over again to me. Sam Altman is clearly a move fast and break things kind of guy, right? And and all there these are, guys are. There's some these true believers are so excited. You know, sometimes I'm in that camp, by the way, about AGI and the potential of AI, even if it isn't AGI, to change the world and make the world a better place, that they're willing to damn the torpedoes. Full speed ahead. Recall feels a little bit like that. Um, right. And I guess you could make the case, unless you are 100% committed to this, it isn't going to happen. Do you want this to happen? Well, here's the other thing. Um, it is still so early enough that we actually don't know if throwing AI into Excel and throwing AI into your email and throwing AI into your OS and throwing AI into your car is what people actually want. Like, uh, I, I don't own any NVIDIA stock, but like there's been some articles out there about like, you know, NVIDIA, three trillion dollar company or whatever. But uh, what if um, all of these companies that are throwing all their money at NVIDIA chips uh, are like, you know, no one's actually using these co-pilots to do Excel spreadsheets because, again, like I said about email, it's easier to just write the two-sentence thing than get the summary. And so we actually don't know. It would, I, It's probably like a year out before we'll know if the actual usage of this of these co-pilots beyond like coding beyond like I, I've, I've heard a lot about stuff in the medical space, in the, in the legal space of, okay, yeah, this, this is obviating a lot of rote work, but yeah. um, is that enough for uh, everybody? <clears throat> yeah, I think another, another interesting perspective here is I think one thing that, especially having worked on one of the co-pilots, I can say that you know, obviously there's going to be the power users, the ones that can do things faster just by doing it themselves. And then there's the other users, we call them everyday Excel users, ones that people are not necessarily experts or the fact that Microsoft has, you know, basically stuffed as many features as they possibly can in their in their applications and people sometimes can't find them or even how to configure them and so the, that's where these assistants come in especially they've helped me over the years actually or, and I think or why do you need ai in instagram uh in theory <laughs> that's a great place to, to teach my mom that maybe she needs ai but uh what would you do with that well why do you need uh amazon echo in an electric toothbrush and we don't but the uh, Oral B sold a two hundred thirty dollar Alexa toothbrush and then pulled the plug. So it's it's not even a Echo toothbrush anymore. By the way, uh, I'm looking at a kitchen with uh, Echo enabled appliances: refrigerator, stove, microwave, and dishwasher. How long before the plug's pulled on that? I guess it'll still work as a dishwasher. Yes, and so I will say. Just for everybody looking ahead, if I were if I were still doing my newsletter, I'd be looking at this. But Amazon in April said they were going to stop giving credits to companies developing on Alexa oh, and on the A platform. Interesting. So that stops at the end of June. Oh, so did you I think be there'll be far for, fewer things that use Echo? 
Yes. And I mean, Amazon is obviously still trying to figure out what the heck they should be doing on a money making side. I mean, they're they're talking about doing now adding AI. And this is I mean, all of this is marketing. Like I've been doing this for 20 something years and bless everybody's heart. You know, we've had I mean, AI on Instagram. That's what filters are. It's just computer vision. Right. That's AI. You know, we want to talk about like. I know everyone's excited about LLMs right now and I am too, but we've been building, we've been gradually building up to this for a while and we're still trying to figure out how to implement. And honestly, y'all, it's not cost effective. Like, and we're going to come into that, like from an ecological point of view, from a, also from a cost, like a server cost point of view. And so Amazon's talking about actually charging people for access to more features. They, they on, told us last year they lost $10 billion in one year on Echo. Did they tell us that or did somebody we see some out. documents or extrapolate it? <laughs> Somehow. Okay, no, I'm just, I'm like, where think, are we on that? I think it was in their quarterly uh, report, wasn't it? Let me see it's if I can find it. It's in an R story. It. Yeah, let me see. I mean, it's still probably, I, I, I don't, I just, I'm like. Am, Amazon is on, uh, Echo is a colossal failure on pace to lose $10 billion this year. This is, uh, Ron Amadio writing in Ars Technica. Yeah, but that uh, was estimates. This is a report from Business Insider. So this is probably guesses. Yes. Um, no, but I don't think it's, it's probably not far off. <laughs> Let's put it that yeah, way. Yeah, it's totally plausible. Sorry, it's a, you know it's me. It's a plausible I'm, guess. I'm like... No, I'm glad you clarified that. Yeah. Uh, and they did lay off a whole bunch of people. So including the uh, Alexa division, I think. So, uh, do, do, do you find that interesting that again, the, the, what I was saying before of, uh, we don't know that this will pay off for the Microsoft's and the Google's and even the Apple's of the world, but all of the, like, I, I titled a show this week that was like, why are we still doing layoffs? And it is because everybody is increasing CapEx spending right. to, uh, to, to, make sure that they can service all of these AI needs. And so God forbid that your margins go down when you do that. Um, so, so you're firing uh, people so that you can uh, enhance AI, do AI, which is exactly yeah. what people were terrified about. So you can buy server, <laughs> server instances. So, or, or, or actual <laughs> NVIDIA chips. Even before it <laughs> yeah, takes your NVIDIA job, it's chips. taken your job. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so by the way, if you were, Gonna do home automation, <laughs> Stacy. This used to be your beat. You home still, assistant. Home assistant. And home assistant. Home it's assistant. complicated to set up, but if you can get it set up and working, I think I've got it running assistant. on my Synology actually. So awesome. that is the that nerdiest is sentence ever. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually okay. It's not that nerdy because it's very easy to get it running. Getting it to do things is another matter. I figure it. Yep. Entirely. I have cassette Selling switches. Selling that to my sister-in-law. I have cassette switches everywhere. Uh, I have a uh, Amazon Echo enabled fireplace. <laughs> oh, I have an Echo enabled faucet. We're good. Yeah, that's true. You, you, that's true. Do you still use that? I think that I, I think I may have unplugged that. Actually, yeah, because I took Amazon out of my house. So if I haven't unplugged it, I should. Oh, you you completely no you disabled it entirely. I have Google. Amazon was so annoying. Like Interesting. I would be set. I would be like at night going to bed. I'd be like, Madam A, set an alarm for seven in the morning. And it'd be like, okay. And by the way, can I interest you in like a podcast? And I'm like, no, oh, I'm going I to bed, that. man. I hate that. It's driving yeah. me nuts. Yeah. So is Home Assistant open source? It is. Okay. Um, and there's a company also that supports instances of it um, yeah. called Nabucasa. And it's awesome. More turnkey. Yeah, they are awesome. A lot more turnkey, those those examples they're giving. Because I, I think that my uh, my dad, I had tried to set, 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 up, set up for my dad. And it took me probably hours even just to set it up myself. But these other turnkey, turnkey solutions actually help out for you know a couple of minutes. You can set it up. So you pay for... Yeah, when did you set it up? What was that? How long ago did you set it up? Uh, not that long ago, actually. Okay. So does Nabo yeah. Casa sell a, it sells, a, it looks like a hardware device. Is that right or no? It's just software here. They look. sell a hardware device, but you can also access. You can I do a Raspberry Pi, them. it looks right. like. 
Yeah, you can have your own uh, gateway, but yeah. 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 All right. Well, I've got Home Assistant running on my Synology, so we'll see <laughs> if what goes after that. Oh, yeah. You can buy, like, they've got a blue and, like, an amber. And so it's already running on the device, and it has uh, Zigbee radios and Wi-Fi. Nice. And all Because, you know, if you've got a Pi, then you're like, do I need Wi-Fi? Oh, you need Zigbee. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, buy. yeah. Right. And apparently it turns out hat. Apple has secretly been building thread into everything, including mm -hmm. the new MacBooks, the new MacBook Airs. Uh, so is thread the, the, f oh, I don't even, this is, so, this is such so, okay, a bad. Okay. A thread radio is what matter is built on. Right. It's also the same underlying protocol as Zigbee. So it's, you know how you got your IEEE right. protocols and those are like the base layers right. and then you got your like software layers on top. So it's 80, shoot, 15.4, I think. <laughs> eight eight fifty No. So it, it, anyway. is it good if I have a thread uh, radio and all my stuff? Does that make Home Assistant easier? Yes, it could. Well, it doesn't make Home Assistant <laughs> it easier. Makes it matter makes matter easier. easier. Oh. But Home Assistant does have a matter compatible version. So okay. they will support matter, I think. It's uh, Is it getting better or is it getting worse? Can you just tell me that? Um it's always going to be worse. It's always going to be more complicated. <laughs> I'm so sorry. How does your dad like? But matters his, getting uh, better. How does your dad like his new setup, Lou? Oh, Lou's use my mute. mute. He actually loves. He actually loves it. Well, I can kind of control it from here. But that's the big thing is I can help kind of configure it and do it from here. But I think he he loves it for what it does. I mean, it sets yeah. it up for you know you know configuring lights and shutting things off and making sure that their alarm is on when it needs to be that kind of thing. So I think there's lots of things that it can do. I think and, and it can all be set up as profiles and as did as you use Nabucasa or just Home Assistant? Home Assistant. Just plain old vanilla Home Assistant. I want to be able to say, hey, Nabu Kasa, can I do that? Um, last year was their year of voice. Okay. Um, it wasn't going to be Nabu Kasa. It was oh. going to be, but they were like building, that. they were building a on-device local voice How about voice Nabu assistant. Nabu? Can I say that? Let's take a I little mean, break. You can and, uh, <laughs> I can say anything I want. Stacey <laughs> Gingbotham, great to see you. See, again, I put you on the spot. First Home Assistant and next we're going to talk about chips. She is a policy fellow at Consumer Reports. From the Tech Meme Ride Home, the daily news podcast you've got to listen to. Brian McCullough, the host. Great to see you. And Thank look, you. there's his copy of The Power Broker right above his picture of Robert Caro. Are you in the fan club? Is that, a, is that it? No. Uh, as I was saying off air, uh, just I know a photographer that took this picture. It's a great if picture. You're watching it. I yeah, it. Uh, and yeah. It, it's it's him. You're thinking there's two people there. It's him, but yeah. Um, and then there's Alf, as we said. And then there's Alf because is that because you're a blue sky guy? Uh, or, no, or I don't. My cats? kids. I have Goonies over here. No, Goonies over here, <laughs> and okay. uh, Pac Man over there. Uh -huh. I don't know. My kids have filled things with a bunch of. Ah, uh, blame the kids, of course. Yeah, it's all yeah. their fault. And uh, Lou Maresca, who has surprisingly little evidence of children around him, even though he has an infinite number of them. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. They, they know to stay away from my office at this point. <laughs> Principal engineering manager at Microsoft and a welcome guest, former host of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Great to have all three of you. Our show today brought to you by NetSuite. The less your business spends on operations, multiple systems, delivering your product or service, the more margin you have, the more margin you have, the more money you keep. In order to reduce costs and headaches, smart businesses are graduating to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, all into one platform, which means one source of truth. With NetSuite, you reduce IT costs because NetSuite lives in the cloud. It means no hardware required. It can be accessed anywhere you also cut the cost of maintaining multiple systems because well you've got one unified business management suite the improve efficiency by bringing all your major business processes into one platform slashing manual tasks and errors over thirty-seven thousand companies wow have already made the move to netsuite so do the math see how you'll profit with netsuite by popular demand netsuite has extended its one-of-a-kind flexible financing program for a few more weeks, easy to do, go to netsuite.com slash twit, N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E, netsuite.com slash twit, 
to learn more. We thank NetSuite so much for their support of this week in tech. We appreciate it. NetSuite.com slash twit. Well, I've already learned so much here. Nabu Casa and Home Assistant. And it's probably not going to ever work. And my Oral-B toothbrush is no longer <laughs> going to sell me visits to uh, the dentist. <sighs> Let's talk about Adobe. Another uh, pain point for you, Brian. Another issue that uh, the uh, the users were upset about. Adobe uh, sprung a new EULA on people. I've never actually. It's been a while since I've seen so much outrage from photographers and artists, people who use the Adobe Creative Cloud. Uh, this story from uh, Mike Worthley and Malcolm Owen and Apple Insider. Adobe's new terms of service unacceptably <laughs> gives them access to all your projects for free. Uh, Adobe says it's made some alterations to four sections. And then a pop-up appears and you cannot continue on to Photoshop or InDesign or Lightroom or any of your Adobe or, uh, Premiere, any of your Adobe products without agreeing. It's kind of they got you. They got you. They got you by the. Um, uh, I, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't actually opened uh, Creative Cloud since I saw this story. Oh, but go ahead. Let's see. Oh yeah, right. But actually, I will do that as I'm saying <laughs> yeah, this. Yeah, I'm curious. But that's what. That, that's what. All right. Uh, that's what people were complaining about. Is that. Um, like, let's say you get hit by this and, and the language says um, the way that it was originally worded, it sounded like, oh, by the way, anything you create in Adobe Cloud, we can own it in perpetuity and you can't continue to use it un uh, unless you agree to it. So like a lot of people were like, well, I can't follow the step. By the way, keep talking while I try to bring. This yeah. Up. Uh, so there the four sections is, uh, are include. Uh, Adobe has, quote, clarified that we may access your content through both automated and manual methods, such as for content review. By the way, these kinds of things pop up from time to time, uh, Instagram and elsewhere, where it really is a consequence of being able to run a service that they have to be able to do some of these things. So sometimes people overreact to that kind of language. So what, what, what Adobe essentially said is think about what cloud is. It's managed by them. It's a cloud service. And what they were saying was in order to find CSAM stuff, or if you're doing, uh, you know, uh, 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 non-consensual pornography or whatever, we need to be able to manually go in there and, and search for that stuff. And what they're, response essentially in the end was is like that's what the terms of service meant it was worded poorly um i did not get the pop-up i wonder why okay so the pop-up uh, uh, people have reported uh, and is reported as apple insider says uh further tells users that by closing the window they cannot continue to use adobe apps and services and offers a single blue button to accept and continue agreeing to the conditions maybe you already agreed to it and you forgot uh but the worst one according to ai uh, section 2 to our access to your content. Already there's a problem. <laughs> Includes verbiage right, that right. Adobe may, quote, access, view, or listen to your content through both automated and manual methods, but only in limited ways and only as permitted by law. Maybe that's CSAM. I think there's some concern because we know Firefly, which is Adobe's AI, uh, you know, generative right. AI solution, did in fact use content from the Adobe Cloud to train on it, I think, right? Well, so that's the other thing is that in this current AI environment, a lot of people were like, oh, right. Are you saying that you're, that means if I say yes to this, you can train on my content. And, uh, at that point, no, <laughs> you know, um, and, and again, Here's the pop-up that uh, people saw that I don't know why you didn't see it, Brian. But yeah, this, I don't, I, I've opened, yeah. uh, uh, premiere everything. It didn't show you up. Subscribe maybe to that's the creative cloud. Yes, I do. I do. Oh, okay. Did, did Benino, did you see it? Because uh, we use Creative Cloud. We use Premiere for editing. I don't remember seeing it. Yeah, maybe. Okay, maybe this. Uh, maybe Adobe's. I don't know what's going on. Maybe this is a tempest in a teapot. There were certainly a lot of people. I saw people on all over social saying, well, I guess this means I'm moving to Affinity Photo or one of a variety. There was even an article. Uh, all, the, all, all the replacements for your Adobe apps out there so in the in the end their their comment was adobe does not train firefly gen ai models on customer content firefly generative ai models are trained on a data set of licensed content which by the way i would i would argue leo as far as i know they always they've never 
they've never trained on non Adobe was always very careful to say that it was either public domain or licensed yeah, content. creators. One of, that was one of the things creators really approved of yeah. from Adobe. Um, so the first statement that Adobe issued was Adobe accesses user content for a number of reasons, including the ability to deliver some of our most innovative cloud-based features, such as Photoshop neural filters and remove background in Adobe express, as well as to take action against prohibited content. Adobe does not access, view, or listen to content that is stored locally on any user's device. Note, however, there's nothing about training AI. Uh, so uh, Thursday night, Adobe clarified, access is needed for Adobe applications and services to perform the functions they are designed and used for. This is the cloud, right? Opening and editing files for the user, creating thumbnails or preview for sharing. Access is needed to deliver some of our most innovative cloud-based features, such as Photoshop, neural filters, liquid move, or remove background. I hate it when they put um, promotional copy in explanations. That's a mistake, Adobe. Stop it. It's not innovative. It's just a service. For content processed or stored on Adobe servers, Adobe may use technologies and other processes, including escalation for manual human review to screen for certain types of illegal content like CSAM or other abusive content or behavior. And then they specifically say, quote, Adobe does not train Firefly Gen AI models on customer content. And uh, and this is probably the most important. Adobe will never assume ownership of a customer's work. So is this just another case of uh, people getting all upset about nothing? Well, I, I wouldn't say that because I think that people are right to be um, very defensive in this. Uh, everyone selling uh our, our stuff to train AI models. Uh, but again, what this was about was the Adobe cloud portion of it, right? So that if you are making bad images and you're uploading it to their cloud, they're saying the government might come to us and in and, and the same way that they would come to Google or whomever to uh, say there might be some CSAM or, or terrorist stuff in there. I think that's what the terms of service was. The problem is, is that it's completely tied to a creative product, which is like, so you're saying that my content, you're going to scan it every time? Well, they're saying if you're uploading it to our cloud, we have to. And that's why the terms of service were changed. Isn't this why Apple got a lot of heat uh, for proposing something similar? I guess it was because it was on your device that Apple got the heat. I mean, every cloud provider does this, I believe. They scan for CSAM. Mostly using the NCMEC database, they're looking for hashes, matching hashes, as opposed to actually looking at your images. That's why they say we escalate to human intervention sometimes, and that's if it matches, if the hash matches. If our algorithm says it, then right. we'll send it to a human. And, right. and by the way, if you think about it, Adobe is like literally the front line of that. Right. Like if you're creating bad content like that, where are you going to do it? Right. So are we all okay and, and everybody should stand down? No, I would say uh, in this AI moment, always be wary of the terms of service in terms of where, it, be, it, be it Reddit, be it uh, Adobe, be it Apple, uh, eventually, uh, be it... Uh, comments on the New York Times. They're going to sell your stuff to train AI probably tomorrow. Yeah. I feel like consumers are going to take, th there's two ways this can go. Consumers are, there There will be the backlash, right? Not just against like these terms of service, but also like they're going to start placing a prior or a higher priority on things that aren't connected to the cloud because they've re they've recognized and the companies have shown them that they you can't trust them. You can't trust it to work the way you want it to. You can't trust that your data is going to be safe. It basically, tech firms have really screwed up in the last like 20 years. And it's they, they've been chasing the next new thing and the next hotness instead of actually establishing trust and reliability. And I know I sound like a million years old, but like... As they're putting tech in more, it was fine when it's like a phone or a computer, but now it's everything. And we're becoming very leery of it. The Wall Street Journal just had a story like earlier, I think it was this week. And it was like, people don't want to buy new cars because they're worried about the technology and touchscreens in the new cars. Like, that's not an unusual thing. That is really the story of this whole first half of the show. 
is. Uh, oh, I thought you were going to say first half of this decade. Of life. <laughs> well, that too. But a growing distrust of the tech sector. And you're seeing problems in government because of it. Uh, but you're also seeing problems with consumers because of it. And some of this is that uh, we kind of were sold a bill of goods that every that the Internet could be free. And uh, what we what we weren't told is it's free, but it will require a massive invasion of your privacy to make it free. And you, you know what? Also, I think it is. And, and, and actually, Stacy can speak to this way more than I can. But don't you feel like as a consumer, it's the lack of control? Like if you liked how Instagram was five years ago or Twitter was five years ago or your car was five years ago and, and it's like, I'm going to buy a new car and it's not the way I wanted. Why don't I have a choice in that? And, and I don't like it, it, it's still a marketplace. It's it's still there. There are options in theory, but I, I feel like a lot of what the backlash is, is like, wait, I don't want this, but you're going to cram it down my throat. Because there's so much value add, there's a perception of a value add. And again, I'm gonna, I hate to do this. I'm going to go back into the idea that you can sell hardware or a car once, right? And you can like, without good right to repair laws, you can like lock people into your dealership network for repairs. But if you add technology to things, you can charge people license, annual licensing fees or subscription fees, or you can charge people to like for a subscription to heat their car, like their car seats. I mean, like that's why it's happening. There's an, a clear economic incentive and it's not necessarily wrong. It's just that consumers are saying they don't see the value in it yet. And I, I truly don't know what they're going to do. And, and the lack of control is, as Leo was saying, if you want to upgrade your five-year-old car, you don't have a choice because if the new car has the seat warming subscription, and you don't want it, then you don't get the seat warming if you don't want to pay. You it, know? It, it does feel like yeah. companies discovered subscriptions and then everything has moved. I mean, Microsoft's clearly one of those companies. Oh, Lou's, Lou's dropped out briefly. So obviously he didn't pay his uh, subscription for his internet, but uh, <laughs> we'll get him back. Uh, but companies found out that, oh, you know, instead of uh, getting people to buy Microsoft Word for $400, we could charge them $12 a year in perpetuity and everybody's wanted to move in that direction. Mercedes has announced that if you want your Mercedes to go faster, it's going to cost you $1,200 a year, hundred dollars a month. Forget it. Seat warmers. They've actually built in the capability in their electric vehicles to go faster instead of zero to 60 uh, in uh, four seconds is three seconds or something like that. Well, and also like to bring it back to the Adobe thing, um, like what if I make my living on Adobe and I don't click yes? You can't use right? it. Right. Right. Oh, and well, by the and way, here's another insult injury. They'll continue to charge you until you cancel your subscription. It doesn't automatically cancel your subscription. So just to point, if you have clicked that box and you can no longer use Photoshop, you might want to cancel that subscription as well because they'll keep charging you. Well, and if you think about the inevitable way this goes is companies charging a subscription or per use thing, even if we are like, OK, at least they're disclosing it to people. Right. Then you lose the ability to own an asset and build value off of it. So here comes like Stacy, communist, you know proletariat person, you can no longer, if, if it's a pay for use or a monthly subscription for your business, you have to price accordingly and you can no longer amortize that asset and build off of it once you've paid it off because mm -hmm. you will never pay it off. And that, that hurts wealth generation. And right. If you, if you buy a, if you buy a physical computer for your company, you can write that off. Over, you can amortize that over time. If you buy a car uh, for your company, you can. But if you're subscribing to a car, if you're subscribing to a software, like, right, it, 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 it's, it's an inability to even control, um, right, the value that you have for the thing that, that you paid for. It turns everything into OPEX. It's kind of, and we did that with cloud and it was really good for startups, right? Because you could actually build a business, but once you built it to a certain point, it became, that OPEX became prohibitively expensive to keep and maintain. So then you saw companies try to either build their own infrastructure or 
really right size and do deals with the big companies. Again, I feel like I feel like such a like, yeah, like a Karl Marx or something. <laughs> you call me like, you. Well, that's what I the, really like. That's what 37 signals technology. did. Remember David Hennemeyer Hansen's series of articles about how expensive the cloud was for them now that they're established and big and they moved everything yeah. back in on prem and saved themselves millions a year. Uh, but, but, that ignores the fact that maybe 37 signals wouldn't exist if they hadn't had the ability to do cheap cloud up front. So maybe it's just part of the uh, uh, evolution of a business. Well, or is it the evolution of a whole entire economy? Maybe that's And it. again, yeah. Stacy, Stacy putting on her like crazy brain, but we have built an economy and even the industrial revolution, like there was, there was, that was a revolution for a reason. Um, we might be in another shift where we have to figure out the give and take between consumers and producers in an economy that works for both parties, obviously. Well, and, and I'm going to bring it back to Microsoft since Lou isn't here. <laughs> but what what the Microsoft backlash is essentially to the whole, uh, it's not rewind, uh, recall, um, is that there, everyone's saying, okay, they're probably not going to sell ads against us right now, but we don't have any faith that they won't five years. That's right. That's yeah. right. And, and there's nothing to stop them from changing that, is there? Well, once well, you once you have the subscription, again, this is what we're saying. What are you going to do? Stop using Windows? Are you going to brick your, your laptop? Right. Yeah, that's exactly what it, so, Adobe, whether it do, what Adobe did was okay or not, they demonstrated the ability to do it. <laughs> so if this they, is what I'm working on. Yeah. This is why I'm at CR, because I'm thinking about policy mechanisms to, to help consumers out. I mean, fundamentally. So we all can because, agree that Microsoft really is the reason. Oh, I'm going to lose back. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, did you go to work? Where did you go? You went to your office? I, I actually lost uh, power, unfortunately. So oh, golly. Um, okay, so switch your mics because you're uh, not on the right mic yet. But we'll... There we go. How's that? Yeah, beautiful. So yeah, did yeah, you go somewhere that. else? Yeah, did you drive to a coffee shop? What? <laughs> no, I'm on I'm on a generator now. Though, so this wow. is a different machine on a different generator. Yeah, Holy cow. <laughs> Massive power outage in the Pacific Northwest. Details at 11. Well, no, but Stacey, oh, wait, where are Stacey's you? Is it a windstorm? No, he's in. Yeah, I forgot. He's in. He's in the East Coast. He's on the East Coast. I forgot. That's right. You yep. moved. Yeah. In fact, you're right the, by the my mom. The weather's lovely in Brooklyn, so I don't know. <laughs> it is lovely. It is nice here, actually. Yeah. It's summertime. All right, let's take a break. I want to take another break, and we will uh, go on. I actually like this. We're gonna have more for Stacy in just a little bit. I want to talk about Samsung suing Aura preemptively. Preemptive lawsuit. It's a whole new thing. Very exciting. But first, a word from our sponsor, Zscaler, the leader in cloud security. The Z stands for zero trust, zero knowledge. It's no surprise cyber attackers are now, guess what, using AI in creative ways to compromise users, breach organizations. Uh, did you see the story about the CEO of an ad agency who barely thwarted a hacking attack where the bad guys were doing uh, using deep fakes of his voice? to get his CFO to write big checks or the finance worker who thought he was at a zoom meeting with the boss. Uh, and it turned out they were all deep fakes trying to convince him. I think he did write a $25 million check. There's high precision phishing emails. There's deep fakes. You've seen the celebrity deep fakes. We are in a world <laughs> of trouble. My friends in a world where employees are working everywhere, where apps are everywhere. Where data is everywhere. A lot of companies say, well, I got a firewall or a VPN, but that's failing to protect organizations. They're just not designed for these distributed environments and AI-powered attacks. In fact, firewalls and VPNs have often become the attack surface. In a security landscape where you must fight AI with AI, the best AI protection comes from having the best data. Get this, Zscaler has extended its zero-trust architecture with powerful AI engines that are trained and tuned by 500 trillion signals every single day. But that's what it takes. That's what it takes. Zscaler Zero Trust Plus AI helps defeat AI attacks today by enabling you to automatically detect and block advanced 
threats. Discover and classify sensitive data everywhere. Generate user to app segmentation to limit lateral threat movement, to quantify risk and prioritize remediation. Oh, and yeah, generate board ready reports because, well, they got to write the checks. Learn more about Zscaler Zero Trust Plus AI to prevent ransomware and other AI attacks while gaining the agility of the cloud. Experience your world secured. Visit zscaler.com slash zero trust AI. They're doing it right. Zscaler.com slash zero trust AI. We thank Zscaler so much for their support of This Week in Tech. So I wore an Aura ring for a long time. I think, Stacey, did you did you have an Aura at any point? I really like these. I tried it. My husband just bought another one, or oh. he just bought one for himself after years of not being a wearable It does guy. sleep monitoring. It's on, it's, you put it on your ring uh, finger, you, not your ring finger, your forefinger usually. What do you call that? The pointer? What your index it? finger? Index, <laughs> thank you. That thing. The, big, the one in the front. Uh, and then it, <laughs> because it's on your finger, it's actually very good at heart rate. Uh, can measure your temperature very easily. Uh, is good for a sleep monitor. Well, you may have seen that Samsung expects to ship a Galaxy Ring sometime in August, and they're so worried that Aura is going to sue them. They sued first. Uh, interesting approach. Uh, I guess Aura has been uh, somewhat uh, aggressive in filing patent lawsuits. Uh, yes, the, uh, when I did this story, apparently they've done this to other smaller players right. in the past. Um, but uh, so, you know, Samsung, Samsung, they've got more resources. They're like, we'll get ahead of this one. They, uh, according to The Verge, preemptively filed their own suit against Aura, seeking a declaratory judgment, stating the Galaxy Ring does not infringe on five Aura patents. Uh, okay, there were rings. There was the Motive Ring came before Aura. Samsung I says- had one of the... First, it was called Ringly. Ringly. It was pretty. Samsung, sa or, or, Samsung says Aura has a pattern of filing suits against competitors based on, quote, features common to virtually all smart rings. They all kind of do the same thing. Uh, I was going to say, they might have a patent on the circle, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. they're, so, they're branding them, what, patent trolls, basically? Not really, because I have to say, I had Aura. We've had, actually, uh, I think Aura changed hands. It's under new leadership anyway. But we had the original founder... On. It was a very smart guy, very interesting guy. It came out of university research. So they quite legitimately had this technology. And I have to say, it was better than the other rings I had tried. Uh, but, you know, anyway. Uh, well, the, yeah, the technology wasn't the ring. It was the sensors and the algorithms. Yeah, exactly. Well, I guess you can't patent an algorithm. Yeah. Can you patent an algorithm? No. Can you? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Didn't, didn't this... Didn't this go Isn't to court? Isn't that copyright? Yeah, didn't this go to court? <laughs> I can't remember. Something about JavaScript and yeah. Google? <laughs> yeah. I can't remember what the outcome of that. I think Google won that one. I think Oracle lost. So I'm going to say, no, you can't patent an algorithm. But I might be, I might well be wrong. I'm like, I don't know if I'd say that so definitively, but yeah, yeah okay. Anyway, yeah. so we don't know what we're talking about. That's right. I mean, and uh, why should that With, be I mean, any different in the patent than anything else? Sorry. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. Here's some other things I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, Tech Radar. I watched NVIDIA's Computex keynote, and it made my blood run cold. John Leffler. This is an opinion piece, but I thought it was an interesting point. He's Now, everybody has been praising NVIDIA. In fact, this is the week that it uh, actually uh, eclipsed the market worth of uh, Apple, right? It's a mm -hmm. three trillion dollar company when it comes to market cap. Um, John Leffler writes, "I don't think Nvidia CEO Jensen Huang is a bad guy, nor that he has nefarious plans for Nvidia, but the most consequential villains in history are rarely evil." So uh, he's saying, and this is kind of what we were talking about earlier, that Nvidia is full speed ahead with things like Blackwell. Uh, processors at huge, huge amount of energy. And he's saying this is not the time for us to be melting the uh, any more glaciers. Um, interesting. He calls NVIDIA's Blackwell nothing short of a doomsday device. It even looks like a damn skull, he says. <laughs> he's not wrong. Uh, and he said there's something that Huang said that shocked me. NVIDIA's Blackwell cluster, which will come with eight GPUs, pulls down 15 kilowatts 
of power. 15,000 watts. That's 1,875 yes, watts per GPU. Wow. <laughs> And and put, the, it, put it into perspective, cloud services in order to run these AIs are tens of thousands of GPUs. So 15,000 watts, cow. eight cores. Well, and the current hopper generation chips are 1,000 watts. 1,000 watts. So you're going from 1,000 to 15,000? 15, 15, Is that right? No, Hold you're on. actually going to 1875. Okay. So it's okay. doubling okay. it. Do, uh, eight, you're one to one. Yeah, you're apples yeah, yeah. to apples. Yeah, yeah right, right. Okay, all right. Uh, Wong says, in the future, he expects to see millions of these AI processors in use in data centers around the world. Can we afford this? So let's talk about that. Because like, I think Meredith Whitaker actually did a, a talk recently somewhere. Oh, it was Axios's AI Plus Summit earlier this week. And talked about how it costs hundreds of millions to train these models. And they're going to need an investment on this technology. And part of the training, so there's the cost training, right? There's also the environmental cost training, which I don't think we've accurately like portioned into the cost of things. Um, and we are basically spending a lot of money and we see this a lot. This is what we have when we have a lot of capital going into something, but we had a lot of money going into like stuff that people haven't been willing to pay for. Like, you know, Brian was saying earlier. So it's, it's a little bit like, um, like going all in uh, when you've got uh, uh, 18 showing. If AI could, for instance, create cold fusion, then maybe we'd be okay. Yeah. You know, maybe, it, maybe so, they could solve the world's problems, but we don't know yet. Here, here's the, uh, uh, I, I've been furiously looking for the story that I did a couple weeks ago. But um, so if you think of the U.S. utility grid, it's generally stable and has been and actually has been going down in terms of like if you're con Edison or whatever and you're planning out 15 years because it takes a decade to spin up new plants. Um, and so since I'm not able to find the story, I can't give you the exact number. But um, if for the last 20 years they've been uh, the U.S. utility industry has been projecting either flat or declining usage, apparently they're like, oh, no. In the next decade, it's going to go up a quarter from where it is now or double from where it is now. And so one of the problems that the, the utility industry is having is, wait, are we going to have to, from a standing stop, create whole new power plants just to cover what is essentially um, the the energy demands of this AI uh, moment if it continues to of be a not speculative a fan. technology, right? I mean, can we agree that that is we don't know yet whether AI will pay off or if it's just another parlor trick? I mean, yes, and. That, well, we don't know if it's going to, uh, it's like, <laughs> we don't know if it's going to pay off, but like all good technology, the benefits will happen when it becomes basic infrastructure and right. we can build things on it. Right. And these companies are in a fight to the death to make sure that doesn't happen. And I get it, but we've, we've basically spent all of our R and D like we stopped investing in that kind of basic infrastructure technology and we've handed over to these companies and, and they're doing it and they're they're bidding up for the scientist. I mean, it's not very efficient. Uh, that was a good uh, yes and is the, um, uh, the improviser, <laughs> improvisers uh, <laughs> prayer, right? Um, so, by the way, there uh, it's the Odd Lots podcast um, that did a recent episode on this um, and how they're struggling to figure out. Because, again, if you are a Con Edison or what, what's out there in California? PG&E uh, is California, yeah. So um, if you need to spin, let's say that your, uh, if your, if your um, energy, if you're projecting that your energy needs will go up even 30% over the next decade, that will require however many plants, you have to plan for that now. years ahead of time. Now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's also the problem mm -hmm. in, in terms of like, this is ironic. And, and we're saying, is AI a fad? But there is an argument out there that even if AI is not a fad, 
there is a gating mechanism that could happen because we already know that it's hard to get a hold of the chips to do the compute. Um, but also, what if you can't get access to the compute because forget now getting your hands on H100s, what if you can't actually get access to a cloud data center because there's not enough of them and and or the the energy cost of them uh, are, are is, is too exorbitant. So um, again, some of the people speculating that like if you're an Nvidia investor, you should be concerned about the fact that there could be a ceiling to this that is beyond your control. Well, I think the companies that are driving this have already made their bet, haven't they? And they don't want to be the ones that can't build the power plants to do what they want to do. Of course, Jensen Huang doesn't have to worry about it. He doesn't have to use the chips, just make them. He just sells He's them selling as fast the picks and shovels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but also uh, coming back to the idea of but if you're tech Google platforms or Apple laying or people Microsoft. off, why are, why, are your, why are your CapEx going up? It's not just buying chips, it is building out these data centers. And so that's why you're laying off people to make sure that you have the, the margin space. And and climate change is totally threatening a lot of these data centers. Like one of the mm -hmm. biggest innovations probably of 10 years ago was everybody was like, oh, let's use hydropower to power these data centers. It's why they're in Oregon, they're weird places. So air cooling and hydropower. Air cooling actually did not turn out super well. But hydropower, cheap hydropower is amazing. But we are losing our snowmelt and thus we are losing... Oh boy. The I was like the rivers and, that flow through the dams that generate the hydropower that's super cheap. Have you noticed that all of those chip plants, not all of them, but a lot of them that get announced are always in Arizona? Yeah, why Which is, is that? That's to me. The they worst need place. so much clean I, water. I know why. It's why? an accidental thing. I did a story on this. There's uh the un, uh, Arizona State University, I believe that's the one, unless it's the University of Arizona, um, for weird accidents of history reasons have the best engineers, ah. the best engineering infrastructure. So like if you want to build a plant to manufacture chips, to re onshore chip development, it's like, well, uh, if you want to do AI, you've got to go to Silicon Valley. Well, no, you need to go to Arizona because they're the only people that have the talent that know how to uh, re onshore. You know, we have airplanes. Chips. You could fly them north. <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, actually, that's Austin built their entire semiconductor manufacturing industry off of an investment in the 1980s and in Semtech. And it brought the equipment manufacturers and it brought engineering talent and everything like that. And then IBM stole it in like 2008 in hopes of recre recreating the thing. And they haven't yet. I have to think that it also has something to do with tax breaks. I don't know what they are, but... Uh I'm sure Arizona's do, doing something to get people there well, somehow. Arizona's pretty hot. Uh, the Colorado River only has so it's much It's drying water. up. Yeah. Yeah, Intel's been there for 40 years. Uh, yeah. And as a result, ASU and other Arizona universities have built big engineering um, programs. Programs to feed them. I mean, it's hard to build a level... It's a level five clean room. I can't yeah, I mean that's why. Honestly, that's why uh, Shenzhen makes all your uh, all your electronics because that's where the people are who can do it. Speaking of which, uh, TSMC says we ain't moving anytime soon. TSMC, of course, is in Taiwan. Things are getting pretty hot in Taiwan. China just did a little exercise, uh, just practicing the invasion of Taiwan. Um, of course. Companies like Apple, uh, which uses pretty much all of the capacity of TSMC, the big Taiwan, Taiwan semiconductor uh, manufacturing company, uh, would love TSMC to start building. They, they did break ground on an Arizona plant, as a matter of fact. Nevertheless, uh, it looks like they're going to be in Taiwan for the long haul. Uh, TSMC that makes sense. chairman C.C. Waste said, uh, instability across the Taiwan Straits is indeed a consideration for the supply chain. And I certainly don't want wars to happen. But given that 80 to 90 percent of our production capacity is now in Taiwan, it's going to be impossible to move factories out of the island. It's kind of the same story. Uh, it's a supply chain, if, if not of brains, of 
materials, and you got to have you got to have it all in one place. It's also strategic because we will fight to maintain our ah, access to semiconductors. That's a good point. If you wanted to guarantee the United States getting involved in defending Taiwan, you might make sure that its biggest companies depended on chips from Taiwan. Very interesting point. Uh, nobody is worried, it says here. Frank Wong, chairman of the Power Chip Semiconductor Manufacturing, told reporters, nobody's worried about this yet. <laughs> I think, of course, always there is military activity or showdowns. But again, oh, you got it. You nailed it, Stacey. Taiwan is so important to AI. Even the Chinese know that. We are okay. No problem. Lisa Su, CEO of AMD, says we do a lot of our manufacturing here with key suppliers like TSMC. And then we have also have a number of partners that help us build out the ecosystem here in Taiwan. The, Wasn't I, th I think I saw a story recently, too, that um, uh, uh, all of the fabs in Taiwan, or at least they signal this, which you would do that, uh, claim that they have a kill switch yeah. so that essentially if... Uh, if they got invaded um, and and the, uh, if the Chinese think they can take over these fabs and, and just do a clean invasion, uh, no, like it's booby trapped or something. Right. I don't know. Yeah, well, it's those EUV machines we keep out of China that allow the three nanometer and two nanometer processes. And uh, they said, well, yeah, we've booby trapped the EUV machines. So on our way Which out wouldn't the be door. hard because apparently if you like if you blink at them the wrong way yeah. They, yeah. they go wonky we're gonna give them a mean look as we go out the door that should be sufficient nvidia is uh of course uh in the eye of investors it's an incredible run up on the stock it was 1800 percent or something uh but also uh pat gelsinger paying attention intel ceo uh, again this is at computex in taiwan takes aim at NVIDIA in a fight for AI chip dominance, says Bloomberg. Gelsinger says, Jensen Wong is wrong about the end of Moore's law, and we're going to prove it. Intel showed its new Xeon 6 data center processors with more efficient cores. Um, good for them. Good for them. Competition. <laughs> That's what we want, right? That's true, actually. Unlike Jensen, unlike what Jensen would have you believe, Gelsinger said, Moore's Law is alive and well. Intel will have a major role to play in the proliferation of AI as the leading provider of PC chips. I think of it like the Internet 25 years ago, he said. It's that big. We see this as the fuel that's driving the semiconductor industry to reach $1 trillion by the end of the decade. Uh, to which Bloomberg adds, casting a little shade, Shares of Intel were little changed. <laughs> uh, well, uh, also, I th if this is the same piece that I'm reading from, they say, well, Intel's sales have stopped shrinking. Yeah, uh, that's analysts a good, aren't that's projecting good news. a rapid rebound. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Nvidia's sales are set to double, and AMD will grow more than 10 percent, according to estimates. So. Yeah, that's the same article. That's yeah, Intel. I mean, so ancient history, Intel, like had their do you remember Larrabee and all their GPU efforts? Yeah. I mean this was way back in like oh eight yeah forever ago. Um and it just Intel's and they they tried ARM and they didn't fail. They just been like a one trick pony the whole time. And it, but I also feel like when you say chips to like normal people and this is I mean the stock market's kind of normal people. They're just like they're all the same thing. But like they're not graphics chip versus yeah, a CPU. Right. I mean, there, there's nodes. always going to be yeah. a role for CPUs, right? Like, I don't know. I get a little frustrated. So Microsoft's uh, Copilot Plus PCs are all based on ARM. They're all based on Snapdragon. I index. know. I predicted this. <laughs> I was just so late. But Intel says we're not out of the uh, a game. In fact, oh they've God. shipped the Core Ultra, Meteor Lake uh, processors. Uh, which is interesting because in some respects they've adopted uh, the same kind of uh, architecture that's made ARM so successful with efficiency cores, performance cores. They're now putting NPUs in their processors. And uh, at uh, Computex, they talked about Meteor Lake's successor, Lunar Lake, its next laptop, laptop chip, which will come this fall. 
they are ditching their TikTok cadence, this article in The Verge says, for a whole new system on a chip design that triples the size and more than quadruples the performance of its AI accelerator. They're claiming uh, 40 tops, and they say that's just the beginning. So just as you say... The end uh, of TikTok? The end of TikTok? Well, at least for this, <laughs> at least for this round. Um, but just as you're saying, Luke, oh, competition's good. It's good to have companies right. trying, to, trying to beat each other at this game. But they're taking a playbook out of AMD, if you think about it. They're trying to bring the price performance model down so that, you know, NVIDIA, NVIDIA looks expensive, but then also try to match the performance in some cases, especially at the edge that NVIDIA can do at the consumer and the prosumer levels, and then make sure that their costs are lower. So that's how they will gain market share. I think it's a good model. They're also throwing out hyper-threading which was for a long time uh, their secret sauce, the ability to run a single chip to run multiple threads. Um, Mike, I mean, uh, Apple doesn't have hyper-threading. Uh, Is that a memory bandwidth thing? Was hyper-threading mem memory bandwidth? I don't know bandwidth, uh, that... why they're getting rid of it. I, they're doing low power cores, efficiency terms. cores, performance cores, but no hyper-threading. They're also following Apple's playbook and I guess Qualcomm's playbook by putting memory on the die. No separate memory chips, which is, I guess, uh, good because you've got a hyper-fast LPDDDR5X memory, but bad if you want to upgrade. I think they're probably making the calculation, as as are other manufacturers, that people aren't going to upgrade anymore. They're just going to buy what they get, live with it until they buy the next thing, right? The idea of putting... I'm so mad about that, Really? You want to put RAM in your, in your computer? I do. Well... I just bought my kid because they're going to college in the fall. So I bought them a new MacBook and I got the M3 only to find out oh, this week. Oh, I'm so sorry. That <laughs> I know. I'm so pissed off and I'm a chip reporter. No, I should have known. It's fine. Don't worry about it. The M I have an M3, M2 and an M1 and I can't tell the difference. I can't tell. Well, They're all the they same. Do, they do video editing type stuff. And I mean... They'll be fine. Anyway, they'll this, be fine. Trust me. I'm sure they'll be fine. But will they be fine for four years? And yeah, we did. Oh, I know how you feel. I spent five thousand dollars on an M3 Max laptop, MacBook Jesus Air, Christ. thinking, "Oh, this is future proofing." <laughs> I, I got, and then basically, Apple has said, "Yeah, you know that M3 that was an interim product that we really didn't have our hearts and, and souls in. We're going to the M4, kids." And in fact, this will be interesting. We're going to talk about it in a little bit. But Apple tomorrow. We'll uh, make some announcements at the Worldwide Developers Conference. We'll be covering that at 10 a.m. Pacific. Micah Sargent and I uh, will talk about the keynote. And the rumor from Mark Gurman is no hardware. But I do notice big price drops on all of the Apple laptops this week. So I'm wondering if Mark might have missed that one. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in just a little bit. Before we leave Intel, anything else to say? Has Intel finally found their secret sauce? Have they got their mojo back? No. <laughs> they deserve they deserve to like limp along in the I don't I mean I like Pat Gelsinger but gee ho oh, Intel is such a mon I, I hate that, I don't like that It sounds hey. like it's a little personal for you Stacy. Yeah. No, they just they just so they're like a big hammer and when you come at like after them they're just like they hammer you in the, they could be like a little herding dog that's cute and like herd you in the right direction, but they're like, bam. And yeah, I, I don't like Their uh, rationale, uh, according uh, to Intel, for dropping hyper-threading is that it eats more power and real estate than it's worth. Uh, they said adding more cores is slightly more die area than the doubled portions of circuitry need to make hyper-threading work, but... The E cores are so compact and capable now, the efficiency cores, that hyper-threading simply no longer makes sense. Uh, I could buy that, yeah. I, I have like, a core... price performance per watt is key. Right. I And that's where Intel really has kind of been in a laggard. It's, it's had the performance, but it's the per watt that it's problematic. Well, because, yeah, that's how ARM ate their lunch and how right. NVIDIA ate their lunch on graphics, even if you're like graphics processors. Right. But hyperthreading was their parallelization. Parallelization. Lunar Lake triples the NPU hardware on the die, offering up to 48 tops and better performance uh, as well. 
It does draw a little more power, but Intel says it's substantially faster. That's kind of the story of Intel right there. Wi-Fi 7, Bluetooth 5.4 baked into the chip. 55% less time to wake up wireless when waking up the machine. I mean, look, they're tr look. this is good. They're trying hard. They're trying to play this game. Uh, and they're making changes faster than they probably have ever wanted to in the past. They, they've got I mean, part of the issue is most computers are fast enough. Yeah, that's the now problem. for all. I mean, that's what I'm saying about your kid's computer is it's fine. It's fine. Well, OK, they're the individual processors are fast enough, but accessing memory. How is much still RAM did you get? A big slug. I, I beefed it up to the max, which is Good. not a lot on Apple, but did you get so an air expensive. or the pro. I got the air. Yeah, so that's 24 They don't gigs. need a pro. 24 gigs is yeah. fine. They're going to yeah. have so much fun making those Insta videos. And I don't mind that Instagram is going to make me watch a, a commercial before I see it. Yes, I do. I do mind that. I don't <laughs> want in, Instagram apparently testing uh, cannot skip commercials, unskippable ads, according to TechCrunch. I hope this test fails miserably. On the other hand, if if Instagram really blows it, that'd be good for me because I spend way too much money on Instagram ads. Now, really? Like you buy things? Yeah, and, oh, you know what happens? It's you. I'm sorry. I wake I up. Yeah, it's me. You forgot, right? You stop. You stop working with me for a couple of months. You forget. No, I wake up. It's about three, four in the morning. I think you know. I'll just scroll a little Insta, kind of calm down, go back to sleep, and then at my weakest, they hit me. And I end up buying knives and underpants and funny hats and knives and underpants. <laughs> yeah. can, can you just like <laughs> save it for a day? Like no. I really no, because I look at it, and I, I go, "Hey, this would be great." I want to know what the Venn diagram of Leo's ad profile is: <laughs> knives, underpants, and funny hats. Yeah, they all go together in my mind. Just imagine me in my underpants wielding a giant knife and a funny hat. With a sombrero on. With yeah, a sombrero. That's it. Uh, uh, any artist out there, let's uh, immediately no, get No, I'm, sure we'll, I'm sure the, uh, we'll get that in the club. I'm anyway. sure the Discord server's already they're asking. Already, they're doing it. Yeah, you know how that is. I think I can see which ads I've looked at. Can I on Instagram? I think, I think you guys taught me that on This Week in Google at one point. Well, anyway, it's bad. It's just bad. So if they do put unskippable ads, the question is <laughs> whether I'll buy more stuff or less stuff. <laughs> the ads no, what'll happen it what'll happen is since this is obviously copying uh YouTube unskippable right. ads, is eventually they'll offer you a uh ten dollar a month subscription premium. to go ad free. Oh, yeah. yeah, premium. Mattis says we're always testing formats that can drive value for advertisers, because that's what we care about. Uh, with the with the TikTok generation, people are not gonna people no. are not gonna stick around. They want so. they want to flick. Yeah. Uh, you can flick ads on TikTok. You just keep going. Uh, well, but they will they offer a paid version? I mean, because they have to do it in Europe, right? Because yeah, the DMA. They can't. That's right. So yeah. maybe this is a way to push more people to subscribe. Right, and haven't you heard that YouTube Premium is? reasonably successful i'm not saying that it's you know a i huge, pay like for half of what i yeah. have to because i can't watch those damn ads yeah i mean like once you like my child grew up not really seeing ads and now that they're encountering them places at first it was amusing to them and now they're just like uh of course <laughs> i'm gonna pay for this this is a terrible my, my kids are the same they're like what is this what ads they, they, they literally grown ads ad ad i was like yeah i know Imagine what, uh, my but this is the like. problem. By the way, is that is that uh, the state of Texas made out of tongue depressors on your uh, wall over there? No, that's uh, one of my kids' things. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It says, but I, it, I love you, Papa. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know what it is. Actually, it's not the state of Texas because it looks kind of. No, it just says I love you. Okay. I love you, Papa. That's it. Right. <laughs> looks like the the West half. <laughs> All right, let's let's take a little break, uh, Papa. Papa McCullough is here, the host of uh, the Tech Meme Ride Home 
podcast. Great to have you, Brian. I always love having you on. Same with you, Lou Maresca. Miss you so much on this week in Enterprise Tech. He, uh, but that means you just work all the harder for Microsoft, your principal engineering manager in the Excel group there. And, of course, the wonderful Stacy Higginbotham, Stacy's Book Club coming up in our Club Twit. If you're not a member of Club Twit, Stacy and I want you to read High Voltage. You know what? I'm liking this one. It's cozy, but I don't mind. Okay. Well, it's not about families and ladies, maybe. You know, I had some misgivings when I heard that it was a it was podcasters that wrote it. I thought, oh, I'm not reading a novel podcasters wrote. That's a terrible idea. Stick to your knitting. But it's not bad. It's fun. And it is the 27th. So you are right. Okay, the 27th. If you're not yet a member of Club Twit, consider the seven bucks a month well spent because not only do you get great benefits like access to the Club Twit Discord and the special events that we put on there, ad-free versions of all of our shows. Here's Stacy's Book Club. High Voltage will be the book on the 27th. It's not just that. It's, this, it's that by donating seven bucks a month to our lovely operation, you're keeping us alive. I don't know about you, Brian, but ad sales have really tanked. Uh, don't get me started. Yeah, the podcast industry is suffering. It's all going to Marquez Brownlee, as far as I can tell, uh, and Joe Rogan. Anyway, uh, because ad dollars are down significantly, uh, we are trying to make up the difference by uh, inviting you to join the club. Your support keeps us going, keeps us flowing, keeps the lights on, the staff employed, keeps the shows going. If you like what you hear... Please consider seven bucks a month, twit.tv slash club twit. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. But we sure would uh, like to have you in the club. And thank all of the club members who are listening and watching right now for uh, making this show possible. Our show today brought to you this week by Collide. Oh, I've talked about Collide a lot. K-O-L-I-D-E. Collide is for companies that use Okta. Make sure that the people getting into your network are they not only who they say you are, that's the job Okta does, but that their devices are safe and secure. The devices, the laptops, the phones, the computers they're bringing into your network are secure. You need it. Now, maybe you've heard that Collide was just acquired by 1Password. And maybe you have questions. Well, I got to tell you, this is nothing but good news. Both companies lead the industry in creating security solutions that put users first. For over a year now, Collide Device Trust has helped companies with Okta ensure that only known and secure devices can access their data. They're still doing it. They're just now part of 1Password, which means they've got more resources. They can put more wood behind those arrows, as they say. So if you have Okta and you've been meaning to check out Collide, do not hesitate. This is a great time. Collide's easy to get started with. It comes with a library of pre-built device posture checks. You know, the things that you know you want, up-to-date operating systems, all the patches apply to up-to-date browser, things like that. But you can also write your own easily, write your own custom checks for just about anything you can think of. And one thing you'll really like, Collide can be used on devices without MDM, like your Linux fleet. See all those guys with the tux flags marching into your castle? The contractor devices and every BYOD phone and laptop in your company. And now that Collide's part of 1Password, it's only going to get better. Check it out. Collide, K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash twit to learn more. Watch the demo today. K-O-L-I-D-E. We love them. Collide dot com slash twit. It's a team made in heaven. Collide and 1Password. Very, very good news for Collide fans everywhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. <laughs> Chocolate milk mini sip in our Discord saying ads never worked. I don't know how they're figuring it out just now. No, I, no, that's not true. That's not true. Our ads work very well. That's not the problem. I think the problem is advertisers. I don't. I don't know. I don't quite understand what it is, but they just. Well, the problem is there's just ads in more places, and more places are selling us like cheap. Uh, United. I just saw Costco, United Airlines. Yeah. And they're all like, oh, let me start Walmart. They're starting yeah, ad networks everywhere. based on right. your data. So we're competing Although, with all of them. There's a million new podcasts every week. We're competing with all of them. We're competing with influencers, uh, you know, on Insta. And I shouldn't complain about that because my kid's an influencer uh, doing quite well. Thank you. At least I don't have to support him anymore. 
But uh, all the all the ad dollars are going from Twit to to Salt Hank. I'm not crazy about that. It's also uh, you know it's just also the time as you know there's people don't have as much time as they did. There's lots to do and lots to listen to, much more than there used to be. Anyway, that's life. That's fine. I'm not I'm not complaining. All right, let's talk a little bit. You brought this up, and I thought this was an interesting story, uh, Brian. Um, it starts with. Uh, our friend at Daring Fireball, Mark uh, John Goob Gruber. Gru I don't know why I have a block. John Goober. <laughs> Gruber. <laughs> Gruber. 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 Uh, you want to say Goober? I want to is... say Goober, but I don't. No, I like. I love John. Uh, interesting. He's talking about Mark Gurman's epic. He says leak before WWDC. Gurman and his Friday report at Bloomberg. Uh, he said it sounds as though he's gotten notes from somebody who's already watched Monday's keynote. Gruber says, I sort of think that's what's happened, given how much of this no one had reported today. The Bloomberg headline says, here's everything Apple plans to show at its AI-focused event. It's literally a bullet point list of like every feature, which again, you and I and, and people that do this for a living are used to getting like that level of detail from like what Google's about to announce or what Samsung's about to announce, but never, never from, from Apple, Apple like that. It, and if it is from Apple, it's, uh, it's always before hardware comes out because the supply chain leaks. But Apple does not leak. Apple has very good OPSEC. So interesting. Um, Apple... Uh, German, this is German now. Apple isn't typically the first to embrace new product categories, but uh, Apple found a way to make its mark in the iPhone, the smartwatch, the Vision Pro, even though they weren't the first. Now it looks to do something similar with artificial intelligence. Well, sure, not the first. Apple's probably the last to the AI table, right? Nearly. What is what? I'm oh, sorry. Go, Stacey. No, you go. Go. She just went. Eh. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're definitely not the first, which makes me wonder. So what John says in his piece is, uh, this is unusual. Um, and to which I would say is Apple unusually desperate right now, because one of the things that I, I've said, uh, a, a couple times now is this WWDC is super important to them. Not, I mean, it is, they want people to upgrade their phones and, and, devices and cycles, but they're really playing to Wall Street tomorrow. Oh, that's um, interesting. So, but their stock is is fine, right? I mean, why, what do you mean they're, are yeah, they but worried? What if, it could always be better. Uh, it could always be better. And also what John and other people are, are whispering is, uh, what if this is just like, oh, a smarter Siri? Eh, what right. would that do to this? Right. Eh. Right. That's a good point. Uh, Apple stock has been pretty steadily climbing. They, I'm just looking at their their chart here. They had a bad spring last year, but they've come back from that, and they are close to a peak, almost as high as they were. Uh, well, actually, it was the spring of this year, almost as high as they were at the beginning of this year. So what I'm suggesting, John is John does not believe that Apple would intentionally leak this, uh, and John's more plugged into Apple than I am, of course, um, but let's say you were more conspiratorial, um, you're laying the groundwork for after WWDC ends at 3 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, Wall Street being like, eh, like, are they sort of like laying the groundwork for it not being, you know, like, it's almost like Wall Street would want an iPhone moment where it's like, oh, not only are we doing AI, we're doing AI that no one else can do. And I don't think there's any way that's possible because obviously they're just adding open AI's chatbots and integrating it a little bit into the OS. They're doing exactly what everybody else is doing because they're using open AI and uh, Google Gemini. Uh, you know, it's Apple a good point. App, the stock market buys in the rumor and sells in the news. So right. you would expect a sell-off after a WWDC keynote. You usually do get a little bit of a sell-off. But this could be a big sell-off is what you're saying. Because well, what I'm saying is, is what if you seeded it ahead of time to right. like Prepare make them. it not be such a, yeah. Pave the yeah, way. They're managing it. I would say Apple is actually, this idea that Apple is behind on AI is so weird to me because it, it speaks to like how, 
how muddled the conversation around AI has gotten because Apple has historically done an excellent job of taking really hardcore, deep technology and communicating it in ways that consumers can understand and get excited about. And the fact that they're behind on AI, I don't think is a problem for is, I mean, it is a problem from a stock market perspective for Apple, but it also kind of is a big indictment about like the technological challenge of what AI is and how much marketing hype there is around it that Apple, Apple's basically been doing this. And now Apple's like, God, we got to talk about freaking AI now. No normal person does this. Thanks, Sam Altman. So I don't know if like, are they behind on LLMs? Maybe we don't know because we don't hear from what's we Apple doesn't leak like everybody else does. So there, there's no they hired way John Jen Andrea away from Google, right? Yeah, but but there's no way they'd be doing a deal with other people if their LLMs were ready enough. Like, because again, they would want to do it on device. Um, the fact that like they're already sort of going against what they've been branding for a decade, which is we're all about privacy. We're not going to send anything to anyone else's cloud. Well, by the way, whatever the open AI thing is, it's going to be going to a cloud. There's certain things that will be done on device, but certain things will be sent to the cloud. So they're already going to have to yada yada a huge sort of about face on their whole uh, good point. Uh, privacy. Thing. Yeah. They're going to say, here's the yada yada. They're going to say, uh, we figured out a way to send it to the cloud privately. You will be running on a private cloud that is black boxed. We've heard that phrase already from Mark Gurman that uh, is black boxed away from us and everybody else. So, yes, you're using the cloud, but you're using your own private space in the cloud. And that's better than what Google and OpenAI are offering. Um, I, You know... The problem I see, if 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 Gruber is right and everything in here is accurate, that somehow Mark Gurman has some magic uh, and ability to see, and I think that that's not a given. That we could very well have surprises. There have been surprises, considerable surprises in the most recent Apple updates, Apple keynotes, uh, unexpected uh, things. But if 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 this is what Apple is going to offer, it's all catch up. There is nothing here that is innovative or new or different uh, but maybe apple didn't see any value in it well that's what mm. i'm wondering is maybe apple would apple get killed in the market if they said exactly yes. that stacy they said yes. you know what this is they a would. privacy invasion it's just a bunch of sm smoke and mirrors and we're not gonna play this game they would they because wall killed. street is they're livings they're gonna be killed if they don't have something and i think they're like well let's just put a bandaid on this. We've already killed our car thing that everybody wanted us to do. And we were kind of like not, and it also speaks, I think to a lack of vision. I'll be honest. By the way, that was the rumor like, also from German that when they killed the car division, a lot of those people went over to the AI side that they, that they again, threw a lot of people over there. CapEx spending, like we've got, a, we've heard Apple has to do their own, uh, they're spinning up their own data centers so that they can do their own, uh, right, this black box private, data. private stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, Leo, I, uh, I was speaking to uh, Gruber about this on threads um, in a similar vein. Like, let's say uh, it is just a, hey, better Siri tomorrow. Um, I've been saying for a while now, why don't they kill the Siri brand? Because that's like, what Microsoft if, if, did with Cortana. They right, just pulled because, the plug. Let's say that Siri is better as a chatbot, a, a GPT-4.0 style chatbot, right? But all of us and my mom and my dad and, you know, normal folks ha are like Siri's useless to me. So how are they going to convince people that Siri is actually better if it's just, hey, no, Siri's better. They should they should name it Son of Siri or something. Um, but like this is the time for them to cut bait on that brand is what I'm arguing. Wow. I know people hate Siri, but I mean, my husband talks to Siri more than me. I, mean, I know like they don't like it, but he's constantly like, hey, Siri, do this. Hey, Siri, do that. So I'm like, I just. Uh, OK, so do maybe not ever use it. Uh, never. And no one I okay. know does. But but also what I'm saying is, is because people have that level of expectation in the same way we were talking about Alexa or what did, what did you call her? Uh, Madam, Madam A. A. Madam A. Yes. Uh, like. 
because people have this limited sort of experience with it, well, it can only set timers for me, right? If you really are going to try to convince people, no, uh, uh, iOS whatever has AI and this is the future, they should have a, a son or daughter of Siri, maybe, I think. Here's the problem. And they should do the deal with Scarlett Johansson. They, maybe. Right, 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 right. You know, that would make a difference to me. I have my uh, action button on my uh, iPhone 14 set to ChatGPT. It was 4.0. It was originally ScarJo. Now it's some other lame voice. But it isn't that useful. It's a chatty little... I don't think uh, AI chatbots are any better than Siri, honestly. They can't do any more. Okay, then that comes back to... What is Wall Street going to think when uh, tomorrow afternoon it's like, hey, slightly better Siri? I think Apple's in a crisis. I really do. I think this is going to be a very difficult uh, I think the whole tech industry is in a crisis. Maybe. I think 20 years from now, we're going to look back at this time and it's going to be, I don't know what a historical precedent for it would be, but like all of these companies are flailing because they've all hit some kind of wall in terms of delivering functionality for consumers and delivering like the growth that people expect from tech companies. Right. It's basically like, I don't know, like, you know how you work really hard in high school and college in your early twenties, <laughs> but you don't maintain that you get to a place and then you like, are you I saying, feel like that's are where we the are. Tech industry is having a middle-aged crisis. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I just think we're expecting them to like, I mean, like, if you look back, we're going to be like, wait, this company made computers and then they made like the iPhone and that was huge. And that was like a seminal moment. And then they were like, yeah, we're on it. We're going to do a car. And we all just went, yeah, that's amazing. Why haven't they? I think even you the know, Vision like, Pro just, is, a, is a dead end personally. Uh, I, I think this. Yeah. And you're right. It's not just Apple. Apple's going to be in the spotlight no, it's tomorrow. It's Amazon. It's Google. I mean, them. they're all like. This is maybe why they've thrown so much hope into AI because it's the last right. chance. It's the it's the first technology coming down the pike that looked like it maybe could get them out of the doldrums. I was very hopeful, but I am increasingly starting to think they're they might be stalled. I don't think you know four O wasn't Chat GPT five. Sam Altman says, "Oh no, we're going to have that next year." Uh, spring of next year, we're going to have ChatGPT 5. Is it going to be qualitatively better? We saw this kind of huge growth when, remember when Stable Diffusion came out and the, it, you could look at, wow, AI did those images and then music. We've seen some really interesting stuff and it just, it seems to be stalling out. I don't know. Lou, what do you think? <laughs> I, you know, I think it's one of those things. It's, it's a gate, definitely a gateway technology to the next level. I think that's what the, most of these companies are, are worried about. They're hoping for. They're hoping, right? they're hoping for. They're hoping for. And I think that's where most of them, I think that's where it's right. Like, I think it might not be in the current stage that it's in or in the current state that it's in, but I definitely think that it will help with research or it'll help with the next generation of what's to come next. But it's not um, going to be changing I, the world. And now they've kind of set that expectation, have they not? That it will change the world? Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, they're setting that expectation. Will it change the world? I, I think eventually it will. Like, I think it's, you know, right now, like you said, a lot of parlor tricks, but I think that there are things that show good promise, um, you know, around I'm with whether you. it's medical or, yeah. yeah so I'm I think with that you. that's where it's headed. Like, I think it's, they're going to put more chips in that bucket, in that basket, and in hopes that, that, that those industries build those things out and make a big difference. And then, then that's when they say, hey, see, this is what we've done. This is what, where we put our money. I, you know what I would love to see them do? I would love to see a complete re architecture of our computing infrastructure. And I mean that with a eye towards security and an eye towards consumption of power, because we did not think about that. And I think we need to do it pretty much from the ground up. And that's like, to me, that feels like something we have all these freaking geniuses that have been wrapped up in these companies and that that could actually fundamentally change the game. But we're very I mean, it's kind of like. It's kind of like the EV moment, right? Like we're going to fundamentally re-architect the combustion engine. And I know I'm, I sound like a crazy person and I am, but like, I feel like we're like where mobile was. Remember like 5G and everyone's like trying to make 5G happen. And that was partially because we hit a wall in mobile. We've done a lot of. 
what well, needed and, to be done. And AI has gone through multiple AI winners. AI has been the next big thing more than once and flopped. So uh, is this going to be different? Here from the futurism, uh, Victor Tangerman writing in The Bite, AI appears to be rapidly approaching a brick wall where it can't get smarter. Uh, now, this is an opinion piece. There are researchers, though. In fact, uh, one of them is Tamei uh, Besseroglu, who wrote a new paper to be presented uh, at a conference this summer. There's a serious bottleneck here, Tamei says. If you start hitting those constraints about how much data you have, in other words, if you've sucked up all the data in the, in the biosphere, you can't really scale up your models efficiently anymore. And scaling up models have been probably been the most important way of expanding their capabilities and improving the quality of their output. There is a sense, perhaps, that AI has now eaten everything it could. In fact, some AI researchers are proposing that AI start snacking on AI-generated data. Outfits include synthetic. open AI synthetic. Like synthetic data? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh, AI, there's, open there's, AI, Google, and Anthropic already working on ways to generate synthetic data for this purpose. There is an argument out there that there's an asymptote for what this generation is like everything is based on this transformer model that's created this generation of uh, large language models. There are a lot of people that are looking for alternatives to the transformer model. And so maybe we're waiting on that step change. But one of the things that a lot of people, if you looked at the cadence of when, if we assume OpenAI is still the best funded and the, the cutting edge in terms of the technology, a lot of folks thought that this summer was going to, be when GPT-5 came. And the fact that it hasn't come is not calming those whispers of people wondering if there might be an asymptote for this current generation of technology. Wow, you heard it here first, folks. I have been uh, criticized roundly by the folks on Twig for being such an AI optimist and so bullish on AI. But I'm wondering if we've kind of reached the stall, the stall, and uh, we are about to head uh, in the uh, other direction. And I have and to say, go ahead. Full disclosure, I, I run an AI fund. Do you? That's so right. I'm an, I'm an investor in AI. So I'm saying this while I'm cutting checks to uh, AI startups. Do you, are, is there credible, are there credible alternatives to the transformers, uh, the LLMs we're using today? Uh, nothing that has gotten the traction that's necessary. Um, but also that's why I'm speaking from a position of like, there is a sort of freeze in investing right now because everyone was waiting for GPT-5 to come out. Right. And so that and puts a freeze on, like, right. Which also, uh, obviated a bunch of chatbot startups. So like if you're, if you're an investor in the space, you're waiting to see what the cutting edge is because you're afraid that what the cutting edge would be, would be a hundred X improvement and would obviate a company we're going to invest in. Now, what do you do if uh, what you thought was the next generation is still a year away? Like that's a weird situation that the, the AI space is in right now. And I know this is weird inside baseball stuff, but um, like, so there's kind of like a, there's kind of like a pause going on right now. That's yeah. actually really interesting. Yeah. Stacey, you were the first person to explain what a GAN was to me, a generative <laughs> adversarial network. That was a pre-LLM technology. There's neural networks. There are other mo modes uh, out there. And, uh, and a lot of the most interesting stuff happening in AI is not happening in LLMs right, right. now. Um, but I don't see evidence that we are, I think you might be right. We might be at an asymptote. Whatever. Or at least for, for this generation. And by the way, tomorrow, a paper could come out that could, right. again, blow, blow away this current, uh, yeah, generation. tomorrow we could have cold fusion and, uh, we could have invented <laughs> time machines. You never know. Tomorrow it, always is exciting. I think it's historically, though, if you think about it, though, yeah, obviously AI has been big for a while and it hasn't been succeeded. But I think the amount of capital being put in now uh, in it from these big tech companies is so great 
that if that little thing does come out and that new paper does come out, how fast does it get to market? And I think that's the key that, that what I'm hoping for is that the, these, you know, the, the next generation of GPT, you know, maybe it's compute that they're waiting on. And once that happens, then it's going to be out. And that's when we see the next shift forward. Oh, and I know. should say uh, uh, to what Stacy was talking about, like, with, like with power, what we were all talking about in terms of power, like everything that is trying to be the next generation beyond um, uh, tra- the transformer model is, oh, the, the inference will be a hundred X cheaper. The, the energy usage will be a hundred X cheaper. So like ev- what everyone's trying to go for is to take what the current generation is and just make it like, again, generationally easier, run it on your phone, uh, not, you know, have to uh, burn the planet down to do it. That sort of thing. It is interesting. Hey. If you got every tech company in the, in the world uh, and all the money in the world, Behind this effort, you'd think something would come out of it. Uh, have we, I mean, short of the moonshot, you know, uh, the Apollo program, um, maybe World War II, it's not that often that you see all of these resources being dedicated to a single goal. Seems like it, you, you should be able to accomplish something. Go ahead, Stacy. Well, I was going to ask if, if anyone has been doing reading possibly Brian on subquadratic scaling and subquadratic uh, computing. Is it, is that, uh, uh, that, that would be different than quantum computing. Uh, yeah, this is a, this is kind of like a, it's like one of the alternative architectures for types of building, like the alternative for building a transformer model. Mm. Well, there's several, there's several out there. Yeah. Um, so um, again, like, let's listen, listen, um, this is this would be uh, an argument, f- uh, you know, uh, th- about like OpenAI and NVIDIA. If tomorrow someone came out with an alternative to the transformer model that was 100x cheaper on inference, 100x cheaper on compute, 100x cheaper on, on energy, then especially if it was open source, everyone would jump to it. Like uh, OpenAI would be in trouble like literally overnight. Although if it was open source, then why wouldn't they just fork it and do it themselves? But yeah, and that's, I mean, when I'm, you know, because I, I wrote about computing architectures for years, and mm-hmm. those were the exact sorts of things I looked for. I'm like, hey, does your new networking technology give you this, this, or this? Um, and and that's, again, I'll just do this. I think that's why we need to think about, like, rethinking how we architect computers, mm-hmm. because we're mm-hmm. basically building on a model that was built, what, in the 50s around the transistor? And we've had some incremental changes, but... I feel is like, subquadratic what, scaling it, still von Neumann, or is it a new way, a new architecture? Uh, it is. It is a different way of building a model. It's not. It's probably still built on a von Neumann okay. thing. It's not like a quantum computing thing. Right. Um, but I don't know. I I don't know. I I just I feel like. I feel like the marketing has overtaken the actual innovation that we had here and everybody so quick to chase after these things. And I feel like, who was it who said, like, if I asked people what they wanted Ford, they would have said faster horses. I feel like we're in a faster horses moment Maybe. and we need yeah. somebody to be thinking about cars. We're all making buggy whips. And then there's China. I mean, there, are, we can't really see behind the silk curtain, but I would imagine that China's working as hard as they can on this as well. And certainly they've been using AI and social credit, social scoring scenarios, things like that, face recognition for some time. Uh, is some of this a defense against what China might come up with? I mean, everybody thinks they're in like a prisoner's dilemma of if we don't right. invest and forget about China. Why is everybody spending all this money is Google thinks if we don't invest in this, we'll be dead in two years. Yeah. Uh, My- sure. Microsoft, Microsoft has been rewarded by at least until Nvidia passes them <laughs> this week or something. The, the most valuable company in the world, because they seem to be further ahead in AI. all of the incentives. I, I, I agree with you, by the way, Stacy, uh, to, 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 to date, 
AI is essentially a marketing thing. Uh, again, I don't mean to uh, focus on Microsoft, but um, uh, all of these, uh, uh, what, what do they call the new PCs, Leo, um, that are AI? Copilot Plus PC. Plus, yes. Okay, what is that? It's it's getting me to uh, upgrade my PC. What is what is Apple hoping to do tomorrow? Hey, I need to get the new iPhone because the new iPhones will have the, the AI goodness on them. So it is all marketing right now. Um, but at the same point, like nobody feels like that they can do otherwise because if um, if 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 they feel like a year from now um, their pants are down and and uh, and they haven't invested enough, then they're going to get killed. I think tomorrow is going to be very interesting. I think Apple has a is a real conundrum, and I don't know if they'll be able to say anything that is going to make people feel better about their plans going forward they're either going to annoy people who expect apple to be for in the forefront of privacy and security uh or annoy the people who say apple you, you know you've got to be a, a, an ai leader and instead all you're doing is adding uh, better smarter editing to photos you know oh good you can erase backgrounds and photos we've been able to do that on android for years right i think and this a is where doing a lot of this research in like a public company place is really a problem because they're all chasing the same idea before it's fully fleshed out necessarily or before we've like if it were in a university setting, there would be much right. less pressure to everyone. Like, well, kindly. also, the incentives are driven by the stock market, which right. I mean, I, you might believe in the wisdom of crowds, but I'm not convinced that the stock market is the best oh arbiter God, of just, what's the right way to do it. Yeah, it's a bunch of like dudes on Wall Street who I used to cover traders. They're not that smart. It's a bunch and of computers. dudes buying GameStop for crying out loud. <laughs> okay, it's not those. It's not those guys. That's a different, different class different of dudes. dudes. Different dudes. But also but only slightly different. <laughs> they have fancier clothes, nicer shoes. Uh, yeah, well, I don't. You know, it's funny. I really uh, don't know where the stock market is these days it's it's all programmatic trading right it's all done instantly nobody there's nobody on the trading floor anymore uh institutional investors are very very powerful um it, which incidentally the nor is it the norwegian sovereign fund with uh around one percent of tesla stock says elon should not get that uh, pay with raise and elon's going to them saying come on i need the money uh those guys have a you know CalPERS, big and in, big institutional investors, but are they smarter? Is the guy who runs CalPERS investments smarter than you or me or Warren Buffett? I don't know. And should they well, be just should they be deciding on what our priorities priorities are? They're not deciding. They're I mean, they're following the same hype that people like myself used to generate based on having these cool conversations and being future, like there's a, a huge lack of skepticism in a lot of tech reporting. Yeah. I'm so sorry, y'all. Um, Cause we we're big nerds. We get excited about this stuff. And then we're like, yeah, this will happen. Um, and because we're young, I'm not anymore. That's why I'm such you're, a you're young, you know, uh, somebody in the chat room is uh, Martin's reminding me that Jeff and I are, are too old to see what's going to happen. <laughs> You're young enough to see what's going to happen. Good luck. <laughs> Unless AI comes up with a pill that prolongs life. Then maybe, maybe. That's what I'm rooting for. We'll take a little break and wrap things up soon with a wonderful panel, Lou Maresca, whose power is back. At least I think it is because your backdrop has changed. It is back. Thank you. Yay. No, it's an AI. It's an Do AI. Do you have one of those? Um, do you have one of those Generac uh, gas generators? I do. That's cool. I do, but it kicks. It takes a while to kick in, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, we I bought. We had power. We have power walls. I and uh, and solar panels. And I thought, oh, you know, the power goes out. It'll just switch over, and there'll never be a blip. And then we could just run indefinitely because the sun will charge us in the day. We'll power down at night. And just, but it didn't work quite that way. There's a there is a the switch over. You got to get. I don't know how we fix that. There's gonna be a. It's a it's a safeguard. So it's not to overwhelm the oh, system. Oh, so it has to be that way. So you, you're going to need like, well, no, because the software wouldn't help. We're going to need a bigger gonna battery. You're just going to have to experience a minor bit You'd have huge of capacitors in your house if you didn't want to have that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you could be like a laptop and run through the battery. Why don't we run through the battery? I don't know. Anyway, it's good to have you, Lou. <laughs> Brian McCullough, the 
true Scotsman, Brian McCullough, from the Tech Meme Ride Home I'm going to keep podcast. saying Irish. No true Irish Scotsman would wear a kilt. Uh, is here. He's Tech Meme Ride Home podcast. I just say you just look more Scott all the time. You don't look yeah, more but Irish. Remember, Scots Irish are it's basically the same folks. Yes, yeah, yeah. same. It's my people too. I'm a Dunlap on my mother's side. So there you go. My middle name is Garden. And uh, Stacy Higginbotham, policy fellow at Consumer Reports. Great to have you and your glasses today and your blue hair. Uh, and I love the CR behind you. That give, that adds class to the whole thing. Oh, they, they gave it to me because I was doing all these talks for them. And I was like, can I have something to represent Yay. the CR? And they were like, that's really good. Bloop. I love it. Yeah, I it's see. subtle, but it's there. And I really like it. Uh, it's so nice to see you again. Uh, we miss you on this weekend, Google, I have to say. Our show today brought to you by ExpressVPN. Now, we've talked umpteen times about how ExpressVPN protects your privacy and security online, right? But here's something you may not know. You can also use ExpressVPN to unlock movies and shows that are only available in other countries. You can use it to get around geographic restrictions. So, for example, you've got a Netflix subscription, but you've seen everything you want to watch on Netflix in your country. Well, with ExpressVPN, you fire it up, and suddenly you can be in the docks in London. See all the Friends or Parks and Recs episodes you want. Go to Canada. You can see Vikings or Fargo. Go to Australia. It's Rick and Morty. You see, there's a whole world of entertainment just waiting for you to push that button, that big button on ExpressVPN. Those apps are fantastic. iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, Linux. You fire up the app. You pick your location. Normally, when you press that button, it picks the nearest location, the fastest location. But you can set it to be anywhere, and ExpressVPN is all over the world. So you you press the button. You say, I'm, uh, I'm on the London docks now. Refresh Netflix. All of a sudden, it says, hello, mate. Well, <laughs> hello, Mary Poppins. You want to watch Friends? And you're there. ExpressVPN lets you control where you want sites to think you're located. In fact, over 100 different countries. When we were in Mexico, I used ExpressVPN to watch TV in the U.S. because I couldn't watch it in Mexico. There's just a lot of reasons. And it's not just for Netflix. It works with Hulu and BBC iPlayer and YouTube. It's a very cool way to travel the world without leaving your home. There are hundreds of VPNs out there. There's only one I trust with my security and privacy, and that's ExpressVPN. Oh, it's also handy for watching shows because they invest in their infrastructure, so they're fast. Most of their VPNs slow you down. You can't watch HD video. With, with ExpressVPN, they invest in that infrastructure. There's never any buffering, any lag. You can stream in HD, no problem. You can even put ExpressVPN on your routers. They sell routers, very nice routers, or you can add it. Uh, a certain models of routers, you can modify the firmware to use ExpressVPN, and then your whole house is protected. And I promise you, nobody's going to say, hey, what happened to the Internet? It's slow. They are not going to notice, but they'll be a lot safer. ExpressVPN works on your smart TVs and your media consoles, too. Watch what you want on the go or on the big screen. It's the only VPN I use, the only one I recommend. If you want to get access to hundreds of new shows, protect yourself online, protect your privacy, use our special link, expressvpn.com slash twit. You'll get three extra months of ExpressVPN for free when you get a one-year package. It's less than seven bucks a month. It's a, it's a great deal. And you do want to pay for a VPN because you want them to invest in infrastructure. You want them to protect your privacy. They don't, they don't need to, to sell your information. Some VPNs do. Because cause you're paying them. That's the whole deal. ExpressVPN.com slash twit. They're a really great company. Doing a great job. ExpressVPN.com slash twit. Eliminate the borders to your internet. Uh, we will hear from the Supreme Court sometime in the next week, I suspect, uh, on the net choice uh, cases against Texas and Florida and their social media laws. Now New York has passed another... Bill, I don't know if this one's going to end up in the Supreme Court. Net Choice says, yeah, we think it is. They are banning addictive social media algorithms for kids. Uh, they passed the bill on Friday. The governor has yet to sign it, although she tweeted, put a post on X celebrating the bill's passage. So I think Kathy Hochul, governor in New York, will sign it. 
the Stop Addictive Feeds Exploitation for Kids Act. Safe. Oh, isn't that nice? Will prohibit social media platforms like TikTok and Instagram from serving content to users under the age of 18 based on recommendation algorithms. Instead, they'll have to provide reverse chronological feeds for children. Well, or people under 18. Uh, the legislation says algorithmic feeds are addictive, negatively affect mental health. You know, I think there are a few adults who would like a chronological feed on Twitter and Facebook and uh, Instagram. But I think these companies will say, yeah, but you know what? We, we used to offer those, and we find that these recommendations are much better. We can tune it to what people are interested well, in. Yeah, because I could give people heroin as opposed <laughs> to vegetables, and they would enjoy that more. Well, it's not heroin. It's just much more compelling content. I mean, it's not. Is it addictive? It depends really? on the kids. Is it addictive, you think? Like heroin? Oh, my gosh. I have to like I'm a. am constantly pulling TikTok off my phone because. And putting I'm it like, back. Oh, apparently. my God. And it constantly. I do. I it put back, it back. Apparently. But, <laughs> but it is incredibly addictive. And well, I'm a 46 year old. Yeah. But uh, I mean, some for some people, SpongeBob SquarePants is compelling. Is it evil? Well, I don't think anyone's saying it's evil. I mean, politicians are saying things it's evil. are they're addictive. just they're just things. I mean, uh, you could say addictive or or appealing or really great. I mean, uh, if I like hollandaise on my broccoli, should you stop me from doing that? Because it's, so, so the question is, is it harmful? And at what point do we declare the harm so much that we should regulate it? And that's so that's a question we should have. But like that is the actual debate to have here. Not is it evil or, you know, so. What are the harms to kids to make? We acknowledge that it is probably a more compelling feed than reverse chronological order, right? Like, so that's sure. my question, and I don't actually have an answer. Uh, I wouldn't mind. I like, in fact, for years, data, I turned my Facebook and Twitter feeds into chronological feeds because I wanted to see what my friends were saying, not what they the the, the algorithms thought I should see. So I'm so when I'm we have that debate, the, the data says it's bad for kids. They say it's bad for young people to to have a tailored social media feed for a couple of reasons, not just that they spend more time on it, but they tend to get tailored to content that is actively harmful for them. So it might be radicalizing in the case of people on YouTube. Um, in the case of like teenage girls, it might promote like gender dys dysphoria, dysmorphia. Morphia. They feel bad about themselves yeah. and then take action based on that. I mean, like, so when you look at that level of harm, then you might say, hey, and these are kids and their brains aren't fully formed. Let's. let's it raises that. another issue, though, which is how do you know if somebody's under 18? And one of the big problems with this is that age verification is now required for both adults and children on these platforms. And that is, a, I think, very. I don't think there's any successful way to to take ta to check your age with it doesn't invade your. Look, privacy. it's another area for innovation. That's a policy <laughs> and tech innovation area. If we, I'm serious. If you really want to build a business based on this, and you know your product is doing harm, why would you not spend millions of your research dollars and saying? Okay, what is a reasonable way to do it? What do you, what do do you think, Lou? You got young kids. Uh, are they safer in uh, New York? <laughs> are they safer in New York than anywhere else? No. I mean, <laughs> and the, the, the funny part is, the funny part is, you know, the age verification thing is actually a big deal in, in my world because, you know, the kids get a hold of other people's devices or they get a hold of their brothers or whatever. But even in when they have their age in there, the content is still very addictive or, or does sway them in particular ways or so like I do get where they're coming from with all of this but the key I, I think that I'm really interested in is how they're going to regulate it like yeah. how are they going to know that these companies are not doing this right it's an easy thing to say as we have for years that uh, children pro television programming aimed at children should not advertise sugary cereals or, or, or whatever and we've done that for years we've really limited the amount of advertising that can be done but but there's no age verification you're just saying because this programming is aimed at kids we're going to make sure it doesn't have inappropriate advertisements uh, the, that's not what this is though well and also I, I uh, YouTube has brought up 
briefly, it sounds like Stacy has uh, older children than maybe we do, but uh, so I don't have teens yet, so I can't speak to like Instagram and TikTok. But if I feel like everything's performative, if people aren't talking about YouTube first, if you have kids under 10, YouTube is everything. And by the way, YouTube kids exists and you would not believe the things that still get through on the algorithm on YouTube. <laughs> exactly. kids. Do you let your right, kids right, watch yeah. YouTube uh, kids? I do kids. Yes. Uh, yes. You do. But, but, also, but Lou does not. I stopped because of what he just said. That would stop. I'm, the I'm getting in. close to stopping and, and yeah. we, and we stop and then we go back and yeah. So what I mean, happens? Like, you, Leo, you, you give them an iPad and they start watching. Yes. What is ostensibly I give you an example. safe? I will give you a tangible example. Um, so like, let's say it starts with Bluey and um, you you walk through the room and it's not Bluey anymore, but it still is a cartoon. This is the, the God's honest truth. And this happened, I don't know, six months ago. And it is um, the Winnie the Pooh crew uh, in a weirdly drawn sort of AI looking thing. They're in a car going through a McDonald's drive through. The McDonald's is on fire. And I'm walking through the room and I'm like, is that Winnie the Pooh driving a car through a McDonald's drive through? How did we get here? And that's that's still in, in theory, YouTube kids should be protect. Now, I didn't see violence. I didn't see nudity, but it also was not what I was wanting my kids to be watching. Yeah. Um, so that's an interesting problem all by itself. And, I, and as I said, I don't even have teens yet, so and that's I not, have no idea. I mean, yeah. that is, I guess, a recommendation engine. They have autoplay turned on, so the engine right, is exactly. choosing the next thing. So I guess in that sense, but but how would what is a what is a reverse chronological feed on YouTube? There's no such thing. It doesn't make any sense. Or and well, maybe listen, there's there, just no infinite feed. Maybe there's no autoplay, but you could turn autoplay, right off. Yeah, you could turn off autoplay, can't you? Mm -hmm. And and there's there's tons of great kids content on there. Who's who's the science guy? Uh, Mark Rober. Oh, so he's again, great. you yeah. can you can start them on Mark Rober, and then you come in later. And and what it what was my daughter watching? It was something that was like. It was it was still historic, but it was about like let's call it the 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 Spanish Inquisition. Oh, great! And I'm like. That's right, nightmare. But That's nightmare. Territory. It's still history, yeah. but like the the algorithm led her to something that I would be anybody. like, hey. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Well, there's no, I mean, look, I mean, for years I've said there's no substitute for parental supervision. Mm -hmm. uh, parents are the only arbiters of what's appropriate for their children or not. Uh, so l letting oh, YouTube decide is not a good idea, but this, but I guess technology has changed everything, isn't it? I didn't have to. Well, do yeah. This. I mean, a TV is no longer in your living room. It's, right. I mean, right. my kid actually prefers TV on the iPad because... It's they portable, can, and they can just yeah, they can go in the bathroom with, them with them it. They go. <laughs> yeah, right. Hi, this is Benito. Uh, it's also algorithm algorithmic generation because, like, on TV, those were all programmed by people. Yeah, right. but they were or programmed was by a people channel. in response to what they thought would generate more eyeballs. But Leo, and it was still people, it just wasn't as it efficient. was still a channel. It was it was it was uh, uh, Nickelodeon. It was Disney uh, Kids. It was like it was it was. As opposed to the algorithm saying, do you like Mark Rober? Well, you must like science. Do you like science? Then you must like history. Do you like history? Then you right. might like the, the Spanish Inquisition, right? Um, there's no it, human it were, curation involved there. But, but I, I, yeah. maybe this is, uh, okay, forgive me, because I don't have young kids anymore. But it feels like this is parents saying to government, we can't be held responsible for what our kids are up to. You need to intervene. I don't think that's true. I think that is it's a commonly argued thing, but that's kind of like okay. Government can't parents, take the place of parents and should I true. And and they're not, but the government can say, hey, there's a whole class of people who need to be protected from what's happening now. And there's a huge profit motive that goes towards showing this stuff to them. So how do we walk a middle line and smartphones parents don't always have access to their kids when they're on these devices Two, there are plenty of parents who are working and do use the tv as a babysitter because it's less it's more compelling and safer for them to be 
inside. Like there's a whole bunch of reasons why. Yeah. And this is it why it makes sense to make laws. about it, this. It's I hesitate to say it because I don't have to make these decisions anymore. And I'm sure it is a lot harder today than it was 30 years ago to make these decisions. Um, and there's no like the FCC the mandated parent, like parents have to be responsible for what their kids are seeing. And, I'm and responsible me, for what my kid is seeing. They are responsible. But look, their kids are still seeing stuff that they would rather their kids not see. And let me stipulate that I didn't say I was in favor of this bill. What I did say was any bill that does not mention YouTube and Roblox first, right. in my mind, is performative. Because that is where the youngest kids are. And so if you're just talking about Instagram, and again, don't have teens yet, so maybe whatever. If you're just going against meta and whatever, like then that to me is like you're going for headlines. It's if just like banning goes, TikTok. It's really right. not addressing the issue. It's just a, a Band-Aid on the problem. Or worse, it's just politics. And just like an accident happens in a millisecond, these types of things come up so quickly that even if I'm hovering over them like a hover helicopter parent, like I still can't stop them from watching it or seeing it or, you know, and so taking it away entirely is the only option, which is what I've done. Yeah. So. Well, and that feels like a good option. Lock the kid in a room with a couple of books and a box of Cheerios and you're done. <laughs> I mean, come on, let's not go. Let's stop using these devices to babysit our children. That seems risky. My, my son had an argument with me just this past weekend or yesterday. I was reading my Kindle and we had, we had, they had gotten in trouble. So they were off their screens and he said, well, why are you on a screen? And I tried to argue that the Kindle I'm a grown wasn't a screen. Up. Well, and I also was like, well, this is a book and it's not really a screen because it's not a pixel. It's e-ink or whatever. And oh, then good. That like, <laughs> like, like a young, wait, wait, I'm, I'm trying to give him credit. Like a young lawyer, his retort to me was, if it's not a screen, why do you have to recharge it? Oh, he got you, dad. He did. I was like, you know what? You win. And I am, I really don't want to be this, this, the guy that says, well, parents, you just got to do your job. But <laughs> It's clear the government is not going to do a good job of this, whether it's because they leave out Roblox and YouTube or because age verification can't be done in a safe and private way or because parents ought to be keeping an eye on this thing. This is not the right way to do it. I don't know what the answer is, though. I don't I am not in your position. So I've never judged parents for, you know, back when if I was have... uh, raising kids, parents would put these nanny programs on their computer to keep kids yeah. off the internet and stuff that didn't work very well. I first hacked something to get access to yeah. MTV after my parents should. Yeah. It taught you how to be <laughs> a hacker. It didn't protect you. It taught you how to be a hacker. Uh, we, I was very laissez fair with our kids and I've kind of, I feel fortunate that they didn't turn into ax murderers, but my kid, my son is an influencer. So that's almost as bad. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know. He's I not a podcaster, though. He's, yeah, at least he's not a podcaster. Oh, man. Whew. Both my kids dabbled and realized this is a dead end. Uh, I don't, It's really an interesting problem. It is really an interesting problem. And I feel for any parent who has to raise their kid in today's uh, times, I think I would become a uh, Quaker and just, uh, or, you know, um, uh, I would just... Uh, Amish? I would go Amish, yeah. You can have a buggy... And a black mare, and uh, just go go ride around town. That's it. That's all you get to do. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. It is challenging. Hey, Stacy, so great to see you again. Thank you so much for the work you're doing at Consumer Reports. I will see you on the 27th for our book club. High Voltage is the book. If you're not a yet a club member, join so you can join the conversation. We had a lot of fun last time with the the Baba verse. With an objectively terrible book. No. Yeah. Well, hey, you know what? You pick the book. I hate it. I pick the book. You hate it. It's just the way it is. So here we go. But uh, high voltage, uh, I'm I'm happy to say, is quite entertaining. I'm really enjoying it. So I look forward to talking about it with you. Uh, thank you so much, Stacey Higginbotham. You'll find her work at Consumer Reports, and you're writing for. I see you're writing elsewhere, right? You're doing some freelance stuff. Is that right? Every. Uh, not so much. I mean, every now and again. Well, at I least can't you're keep quiet. At least you're not a, gr a greeter at Walmart or something. You're uh, you're staying busy, and that's what I like. 
<laughs> okay, that was not. I was like, that did sure. not go. Over. Sorry, I was like, that did not go. Over. Sorry, I, it did not go over. I'm sorry. I was thinking about Kevin Tofel. I'm sorry. Uh, Don't do that. That's I feel so bad for nice. Kevin. Why is he doing that? He likes it at Wawa. Okay, well, hey, I'm training to become a Pilates instructor. So that's a good thing. Know. But you've been doing that for as long as I've known you. So that's not exactly a change. That's it's just started. You know what? I've just you been, know what I'm getting? My Pilates instructor told me to get a rebounder, a little personal trampoline. That's my next big thing. Going to be bouncing in my stock and feet. Whatever rocks your boat. That's all I'm saying. Nice to see you, Stacy. Thank you for being here. And I apologize in advance for anything I said. Uh, <laughs> Brian McCullough, Tech Meme Ride Home Podcast. How's that seven day a week podcasting thing working out? It's not me? seven, it's five, although six. I did six this week. But yeah. Uh, uh, five, uh, every uh, weekday, 15 minutes, uh, summarizes the news, sort of like techmeme.com does, with a little bit of commentary, a little bit of uh, the tweets and the whatever. Uh, so it'll be late tomorrow because, like everyone else, I'm going to have to watch WWDC before I can actually put the show out. The Tech Meme uh, Ride yep. Home. Yep. It's a yes. great, quick way to find out what's going on in the world so that when you listen to Twit, you'll know ahead of time what we're going to talk about. Yes, it's entirely complimentary. Like, uh, uh, in 15 minutes, here are the five or seven things that happened today. And then Leo dives deep, deep into I confess, it. I listen in that way. I know what to talk about on Sundays. <laughs> Thank you. Brian. By the way, uh, you're saying that now, in addition to your funny hats, your Instagram ads are going to show you trampolines now? Yeah. What was the yeah. other thing that you were? Little, little rebounder trampolines. That's uh, okay. Yeah. Boy, your your Insta ads are different than mine. I'll tell you I, that. I, you know, uh, I think... To me, this is uh, this is gonna be good exercise. I don't know. I'm just I'm just thinking. That's all. Uh, They're super fun. Actually, it looks like a lot of fun. I'm gonna have a professional instruction. My Pilates instructor is a certified, whatever it is, trainer, and so she's gonna show me how to do it right. And I did get a handle, so I won't fall off. <laughs> Thank you, Lou Maresca. You rock. So nice to see you and. Uh, I hope you will come back soon. He's the principal engineering manager at Microsoft, where he works on Excel in the office group. And he's Lou M.M. Right. on all the socials. Anything you want to plug? Are you doing a podcast or anything? No, I'm not. But definitely go check out dev.microsoft.com and check out Office Scripts because that's what we've been working on. It's a new uh, automation engine for Excel. Oh, how fun. We used to have and Mr. Mr. Excel well. on, the, on the TV show. And he would do stuff, and I'd go. It was like magic. It was so amazing. Where should I go? Uh, products? Dev.microsoft.com, and then just look for Office Scripts. You get a list of the top there. Which I like, could do yeah, search yep, here. Office Scripts. Office. Yep. Oh, and then, of course, there's also Python integration, too. Those are both on the on this group. Oh, nice. Very nice. Oh, look at this. It's at it Microsoft Learns. Yeah, there it is. Lou, I love it. That's great. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks to all three of you. Thanks Probably. also to our wonderful uh, listeners, especially our Club Twit members. We appreciate your ongoing support. We do Twit every Sunday afternoon, 2 to 5 Pacific, 5 to 8 Eastern. You can tune in at 2100 UTC to the live stream on YouTube. We start up the minute the show begins, youtube.com slash twit slash live. If you subscribe and smash the bell, I hear wonderful things will happen. No, you'll get an automatic notification uh, when we do go live. After the fact, you can get copies of this show from our website, twit.tv. There's also a YouTube channel dedicated to the video of This Week in Tech. And the best thing to do, subscribe to This Week in Tech. We've been around for, we're in our 20th year now. So if a podcast app doesn't know about us, I'd be surprised. They're not paying attention or they're brand new. So find Twit, subscribe, that way you'll get it. Every week, right in time for your Monday morning commute. We will be back here 10 a.m. tomorrow, 10 a.m. Pacific, for the WWDC stream. Micah Sargent and I hope you'll join us then. Meantime, have a great evening. And as I have said for 20 years, I'll say again, another twit is in the can. Bye-bye.